When we think of demonic possession, oftentimes it involves images of Hollywood films. But according to psychiatrist Richard Gallagher, very few cases are actually the real deal. And of those rare few, some of them are so over the top with what takes place, who sees the supernatural manifestations and truly affects all those involved. This case is one of them. This is the untold story of the Amons family haunting, also known as the exorcism of Latoya Amons, or the House of 200 Demons. In November of 2011, Latoya Amons moved her three small children and her mother, Rosa Campbell, into a new home in a seemingly quiet neighborhood on Carolina Street in Gary, Indiana. The family was ready for a new start, and the children couldn't wait to move in. What they would discover is the home of their dreams would turn out to become something more reminiscent of their nightmares. At first, all seemed to be normal and life was going well for the family. It wasn't until December that they began to experience strange and unexplainable happenings. In the dead of winter, Latoya Amons had noticed the large swarms of horseflies invading her screened-in front porch. She and her mother would kill them, but every single day, they would return in what appeared to be greater numbers. After some time, the flies disappeared, lulling Latoya into a false sense of security and filling her with a feeling of relief. But despite the absence of the flies, the strange happenings would persist. Every night around midnight, when everybody was in bed, they would hear footsteps climbing the basement stairs. In a state of terrified shock, Latoya and her mother would listen as the steps got louder and louder, eventually reaching the top. Once at the top of the stairs, the door from the basement to the kitchen would open, even if the door had been previously locked. But when the unexplained noises were investigated, all that would be found is the basement door open to the pitch black void below. One quiet night, Latoya was awoken by the sound of her closet door opening. As she turned to inspect the source of the disturbance, she saw a tall, shadowy figure emerge from her closet, and then it exited through her door and into the living room. Latoya leapt from her bed and followed the figure, and what she would discover would make her blood run cold. In the living room, she saw a silhouette of a very large man who was pacing back and forth throughout her living room. Who was this man? What did he want? And more importantly, what was he doing in her home? Latoya instinctually turned on the light in an attempt to confront the intruder. But to her surprise, the man had disappeared. Scared and confused, Latoya investigated further and what she would find defied all logic. On the floor, in the same spot where the figure had been pacing, were a series of large muddy boot prints. How could something that was conceivably hallucinated have left a physical mark? Was this an entity attempting to convey a message? And if so, what was it trying to say? These manifestations, mysterious and off-putting as they were, did not scare the family. If anything, it just made them generally uneasy. It wasn't until March 10th of 2012 that those feelings would transform into pure, unadulterated horror. On the date in question, Latoya and Campbell were hosting a wake mourning the loss of a family member, which was attended by a small group of friends, 
and family. The wake had lasted long into the night, and at around 2 a.m. was abruptly interrupted by the sound of screaming. Latoya had been in her mother's room with her 12-year-old daughter and her daughter's friend when suddenly Latoya began screaming for her mother. Rosa sprinted into the room to find her 12-year-old granddaughter unconscious and levitating over the bed. After gathering their bearings, the family and friends surrounded the bed and began to pray. As they prayed, the girl was slowly lowered back down and onto the bed. What is going on, Campbell thought. Why is this happening? When the girl awoke, she had no recollection of what had just taken place. Soon after, the visibly shaken and traumatized visitors left the house and would ultimately refuse to ever return. What began as a place of family and safety had overnight become a place of terror and loneliness. Unsure of where else to turn, Latoya and Rosa called a slew of local churches, but most refused to listen. Eventually, they would get a hold of a church that was willing to hear their story, and once it was heard, the circumstance was undeniable. To the family's shock, officials at the church informed them that what they were dealing with was in fact a demonic occupation of their home. At the recommendation of the church, Latoya and her mother cleaned out the entire home with bleach and ammonia, poured olive oil on the children's hands and feet, and smeared oil in the shape of a cross on their foreheads. Seeking further guidance and expertise, they reached out to two clairvoyants who told them that their home was beset by over 200 demons. The family was instructed that their best course of action would be to move. However, they were strapped for cash and moving was not an option at the time. Instead, Latoya, at the advice of the clairvoyance, made an altar in the basement. The altar consisted of an end table covered in a white sheet and on the sheet was placed a candle and the statues of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. She also covered the walls in the basement in salt, which was believed to add an extra layer of protection from the demonic. Dressed in white clothing, Latoya and a friend conducted a cleansing ritual inside of the house. They burned sage and sulfur, starting upstairs and working their way all the way to the basement, drawing crosses in the smoke in every room. Her friend read Psalm 91 as they proceeded. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. After the ritual was performed, Nothing out of the ordinary happened for about three days. But after those three days passed, the situation became infinitely worse. Latoya started to notice that her children were acting strange. For seemingly no reason whatsoever, they began talking in sinister, deep voices. And their smiles became twisted and curled. She also reported that their eyes appeared to bulge. Her children were acting like completely different people. When the children's appearances would return to normal, following these episodes, they would have no recollection of anything ever having been different. Latoya's youngest son would sit in the closet and talk to another boy that nobody could see. The boy would say, I've been here long enough. I came to kill, and I'm going to kill, and spoke with her son so very descriptively about what it was like to be murdered. Once, Latoya's son was thrown from the closet, almost as if he had been tossed, hitting his sister and knocking her into a headboard, which gave her an injury that required stitches. 
Her daughter would later tell a psychiatrist that sometimes she felt as if she was being held down and choked, unable to speak or move, while voices would say to her that she would never see her family again and that she would be dead in 20 minutes. Latoya believed that she and her children were being possessed. Randomly, Latoya's body temperature would rapidly raise, and she would begin to shake, falling in and out of consciousness. Rosa, however, never experienced anything demonic or strange towards her. To this, she credits her guardian angel. Some nights, what happened to the family was so severe that Latoya opted for them to spend the night at a hotel. Fearing the worst for her children, Latoya and her mother took the children to see their doctor in April of 2012. Upon entering the exam room, the doctor said he was immediately overtaken by a sense of terror and dread, and this was entirely unexplainable. As Latoya told the story of what the family had been experiencing, the doctor was writing down notes that said delusional, delusional ghosts in the home, and hallucinations. Out of nowhere, the youngest son began aggressively cursing at the doctor in a demonic voice. Then, he was lifted high into the air and thrown into a wall without a single person having touched him. The boy passed out, and at the same time, so did his older brother. Medical staff tried shaking them awake, but they were completely unconscious. Someone working at the doctor's office called 911, and eight police officers, along with paramedics, arrived and took the boys to the hospital. Latoya followed and asked hospital personnel to put olive oil on her sons, to which they simply just laughed in her face. Unable to talk to her children, or even to decide what she would do or where she was going to start, she began to pray. At this moment, their nightmare resumed once again. Both boys awoke. The oldest of the two acted normally, but the youngest began screaming and attempted to attack everybody near him. In total, it would take five grown men to fully restrain him. A hospital employee who believed that the boys were being abused contacted the Department of Child Safety, citing Latoya's seemingly obvious mental illness. DCS sent out family case manager Valerie Washington, who concluded in her report that neither Latoya nor her children were in bad health or suffered from any bruises, cuts, or burns. The psychiatrist at the hospital also evaluated Latoya and found that she was in fact sane. As Washington interviewed the family, Latoya's youngest son began to growl and his eyes rolled back into his head. He grabbed his brother around the neck, squeezing tightly and refusing to let go until his hands were physically pried from one another. Later that same day, Washington an RN, and the boy's grandmother took them into a small exam room to interview them alone. While in the room, the youngest son began to growl yet again, looking into the eyes of his older brother in a deep, demonic voice. He said it's time to die, and I will kill you. At this moment, the older brother bent into a running stance and sprinted directly at his grandmother, headbutting her in the stomach as hard as he possibly could, over and over again. Rosa grabbed the boy's hand and said that you are not my grandson. You are a demon. Then something terrifying happened. With that same twisted smile and look of pure malevolence, he walked backwards towards a wall and to the shock and awe of everybody, walked backwards up the wall and onto the ceiling, still holding his grandmother's hand the entire time. 
before flipping off the ceiling and back onto the floor, landing on his feet. After a few moments of stunned silence, Washington and the RN ran out of the room and found the doctor. They explained what they had just witnessed, but the doctor did not believe them, stating that he thought it had to be some sort of trick. The doctor entered the room and requested the boy to do the trick again so that he could see it. The boy replied that he did not remember what had happened and was unable to recreate it. The RN, who was far from a skeptic of the demonic, said that he fully believed what was happening to the boys was the product of possession. And the case manager agreed, stating that there was an evil influence affecting the Amon's family. Latoya's youngest son was admitted to the hospital, and she spent the night with him, while Rosa took the two older children to stay with a relative. The next day was the youngest boy's eighth birthday. DCS told Rosa to bring the other children back to the hospital, as they could further discuss what had happened. The family celebrated with cake, and even sang songs. But once the party was over, Latoya received soul-crushing news. Washington told her that DCS would be taking custody of her children, as they believed they were being spiritually and emotionally neglected. The family cried together. They did not want to be separated, and they didn't understand why DCS had come to this decision. But unfortunately, there was nothing that they could do. On the morning of April 20th of 2012, Lotoya would receive some rather unexpected assistance. The hospital chaplain contacted Reverend Maginel. The Reverend had never performed an exorcism before, nor had he ever been asked, but he agreed to help as much as he could. Visiting Latoya and Rosa at their home on Carolina Street, he interviewed them. While they spoke, Rosa commented on a flickering light in the bathroom which stopped each time the reverend walked over to it. It must be scared of me, he thought. The interview would be interrupted once again when Rosa pointed out that the window blinds in the kitchen kept swinging, even at the absence of an air current in their home. Magino also said that he saw wet footprints in the living room. And during the interview, Latoya complained of a migraine the Reverend wondered whether this could be attributed to the demonic activity, so he placed a crucifix on her head. She then began convulsing. After interviewing the two women for four hours, Reverend Maginel was convinced that the family was being tormented by demons and that they had overtaken their home. He blessed the house and told them the house wasn't safe and that they needed to leave immediately so the two moved in with a relative. A week later, DCS sent Washington to the Carolina Street home to verify whether or not the home was safe for the children to live in. With her, she had a Lake County police officer and two other assisting officers, one being the Gary police captain. Latoya refused to go inside, so Rosa took the group into the home to inspect it. In the basement, Underneath the stairs was a dirt patch from which Rosa said that she believed the demons emanated from. The captain said that he believed in ghosts, but not in demons, and would later say that changed after he visited the home on Carolina Street. During the interview with Rosa, multiple electronic devices carried by the officers malfunctioned even though the batteries had just been replaced. An audio recording taken by one of the officers, when played back, revealed a disembodied voice whispering to them. They also took multiple photos which contained silhouettes, and when enhanced, one even contained a face. At his home, the police captain said that his garage door refused to open and the driver's seat of his personal vehicle 
began moving erratically on its own. After it was inspected by a mechanic, it was revealed that the motor that controlled the seat was broken, and that if it malfunctioned while the captain was driving, it could have resulted in a distraction which would have caused a serious accident. Some time would pass before the same group, accompanied by two other officers, as well as DCS case manager Samantha Illick, would return to the home. Illick went in place of Washington, as Washington refused to re-enter the home. As they entered the basement, Illick noticed a strange liquid dripping. When she touched it, she noticed that it felt both slippery and sticky between her fingers. Magino wanted to check the dirt spot under the stairs for items that may be cursed, as this would offer a solid explanation as to what the family was dealing with. But upon searching, he would find nothing of significance. Magino blessed some salt and spread it throughout the basement, and the group went back upstairs. While in the living room, Illick began to notice something strange happening. Her pinky finger on her left hand began to tingle and turn white. She complained that her finger suddenly began to feel as if it was broken. Then, out of nowhere, she began to feel as if she was having a panic attack and was unable to breathe. The police captain who had many times before seen the true horrors of society, refused to stay in the house past dark and requested that the inspection of the house be hurried. Illick and Latoya left the house and the officers continued their investigation. On the main floor of the house, they noticed an oil-like substance dripping from the blinds. Thinking that Latoya or Rosa may have poured oil on them to sell their story, they wiped it up and sealed the room for 25 minutes. To their confusion, the oil had reappeared. Could this have been the same liquid that Illick had encountered in the basement? Upon speaking with Maginot, they were told that the liquid was in fact a manifestation of the demonic. The Reverend would take notes of his findings and requested permission from a bishop to perform an exorcism on Latoya herself, but his request was denied. Instead, the bishop told him to contact priests who have themselves performed exorcisms, but they were no help either. That night, Magino blessed the home in order to cleanse it before proceeding. A minor exorcism would follow, for which he did not need church approval. The ritual consisted of prayers and appeals for the demons to be cast out. The look in the two officers were in attendance. After the ritual had finished, it looked said that something unexplainable was definitely going on, but stopped short of admitting that it was demonic. Regardless, she had chills the entire time, stating that it felt like something was in the room with them and breathing down their necks. Within a week of attending the exorcism, she too began to experience problems, but hers were medical in nature. She suffered third degree burns from a motorcycle, broke three ribs jet skiing, and broke her hand as well as her ankle, all within the same month. It is believed that these injuries were a result of her attendance during the ritual performed by the reverend. After the minor exorcism was successful, the bishop would give Maginot permission to conduct a proper exorcism on Latoya. He stated that the ritual was the same as the one he had originally conducted. However, it was stronger because this time he had the backing of the Catholic Church. Before the exorcism was to be performed, Maginot tasked Latoya with researching the names of the demons that were tormenting her. During the research, Latoya complained of a physical illness and that her computer kept forcibly shutting itself down. After some time, she was able to locate the names 
of the demons, who she believed were causing her and her family so much trouble. One of them was Beelzebub, the Lord of Flies. Others were demons that she found which specifically torture and harm children. Maginot would go on to perform three exorcisms on Latoya at his church. The first two were conducted in English, and the last was in Latin. During these exorcisms, Maginot pressed a crucifix to her head and chanted, I cast you out, unclean spirit, along with every satanic power of the enemy, every specter from hell, and all of your companions, in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ. Each time, his voice became louder and more forceful, which worked in weakening the demons. Latoya convulsed violently, showing off the demon's true strength to Magino. During this time, Latoya prayed with him until it became too physically painful for her to continue. She equated the pain that she was feeling to the pain of childbirth, but stated that the pain was nowhere near natural. Eventually, Latoya fell asleep and the ritual had ended. In between the second and third exorcism, which were conducted several weeks apart, a woman who had helped with the rituals was tasked with setting up a backup plan in case Latoya had issues. The woman who wrote the name of a demon on a piece of paper put it in an envelope and surrounded it with salt that had been blessed. If Latoya had problems, the woman was to burn the envelope containing the name of the demon. Within that time, Latoya and her mother had moved into a new home in Indianapolis, a home which Maginot had previously blessed. One night, as a storm raged outside, Latoya would call Maginot complaining that she was having horrifically bad nightmares pertaining to demons. So, the woman was instructed to burn the envelope, and after this, the nightmares would cease. Time would pass, and new tenants would eventually occupy the home on Carolina Street, and the landlord would say that since the incidents involving the Amons family, no other paranormal activity had been reported at the residence. Latoya would eventually regain custody of her children in November of 2012, and DCS would regularly check up on them until January of 2013, when they would ultimately close their case. They noted that there were no demonic presences reported at their home in Indianapolis, and that her children felt much safer within its walls. Amons thanked God for guiding them through, and the family would go on to live happily and quietly without any semblance of demonic intervention. So, if we accept at face value those who witness these bizarre and demonic manifestations, we must ask just what could have caused the haunting or the summoning of the entities. Did Latoya mess with something that she shouldn't have? Was it something indeed invoked within the property itself at some point? Or could it have been generational? It's hard to tell, but what is incredible is that nurses, officers, and other officials of the state bore witness to these happenings. Although not descriptive as some of my other videos, the information at times is scarce so I did the best I could to piece everything together. It is believed that the other 199 demons were under or serving Beelzebub, which certainly made himself present with the swarms of flies in the depths of winter. Ultimately, I am glad that this family was able to free themselves from the ensnaring trap of the devil and his minions. Not everyone is so lucky and in due time, we'll cover cases that reflect that. So my advice, if you enter a home, let alone live there, and feel as if eyes are boring a hole into the back of your head, 
and you feel scared for no reason, trust your gut because ultimately it could end up saving your very soul. When a young woman begins to experience horrific visions, daymares during her waking life, she will seek help from her parents. Believing the matter to be spiritual, they consult a priest who tries to drive multiple demons out of her body. However, ultimately, the exorcisms would fail. The result of which has created one of the most compelling and yet controversial cases of the 20th century and possibly ever. Today, we will be examining the life and death of a young woman named Annalise and the six demons that supposedly took her. This is the untold story of the exorcism of Annalise Michelle, and what a terrible and truly horrifying story it is. Before I begin this dark and extensive story, there's a few things that I would like to say. Whether this is a true case of demonic possession or the result of malpractice due to religious extremism is not up for me to decide. I will simply present the case as chronologically accurate and full of details I can, and ultimately, the conclusion is up to you. So let us first start at the beginning. Joseph Michel, who had served in the military during the war, was thankful to have returned to his family's small village following his imprisonment by the Americans and sequential release in late 1945. Having seen the horrors and ravages of combat, he thanked God that his small village of approximately 3,000 souls hadn't been attacked during foreign army occupation or the devastating air raids that leveled most major cities in Germany. He would be reunited with his family and would assume a job within his family's business. And during this time, he would meet a woman named Anna, a local girl. And within two years, the couple would be married. Born as Anna Elizabeth Michelle on September 21st of 1952 in Leipzig, Bavaria, West Germany. Anna was a very shy and somewhat sickly child as she grew up. Michelle was raised along with her three sisters as very religious and as a family they would all attend mass twice a week. And although frequently sick, she was known for being very sweet but also very shy, usually keeping to herself and her studies while at school. All was going well for Anna, who had become known by the name of Annalise a combination of her first and middle names. This was until she turned 16 years old. Shortly after her birthday, Annalise had a moment where she fainted in front of her younger sister, and upon her sister calling her name and poking her in the arm. When she came to, she believed that she was just exhausted from studying too much and decided to lay down for the night. But that night, little did she know, that her torment would begin. As she slept in her bed, shortly after the clock had struck midnight, Annalise would awaken in a panic as a giant force, as she would later describe it, was holding her down. She felt the area around her indent as if a very large person or creature was sitting on top of her. This entity then began to press on her stomach which caused her to urinate. Panicking and unable to breathe, the poor woman called out to God in a desperate attempt to stave off whatever this thing was. Convinced that she was dying, she pleaded to be freed. However, upon the nearby church clock tower sounding the quarter hour, it was all over. All pressure had ceased, as if it was blown away by a wind. Whimpering in terror now, Michelle changed her linens and would barely sleep that night. She would inform her mother the following morning that she felt very ill 
was exhausted, and who can blame her? So her mother allowed her to stay home from school. Nearly one year later, during the day of August 24th of 1969, whatever it was, decided to strike again. Just as what had happened before, she had blacked out earlier in the day, and later that night, right after midnight, yet again, she felt the familiar but terrifying large force begin to hold her captive yet again. She was unable to breathe and unable to call for help. Again, she would be freed by the tolling of the church clock bell tower. Upon informing her mother of this second incident, her mother was unsure of what was happening to her poor daughter, so she decided to take her into the family physician, a man named Dr. Vogt. At the recommendation of Dr. Vogt, they would board a train to Aufschenberg to meet with a neurologist by the name of Dr. Siegfried Luthi. Dr. Luthi that day would run a variety of tests, all which would come back negative, and unsure of the results, he asked them to return on August 27th for a follow-up appointment and more tests. One of the tests ran upon their return in August was an EEG, which recorded normal alpha-type brain activity. Coming up yet again empty-handed, the doctor still had to account for the convulsive episode that his patient said she was experiencing, so he diagnosed her with temporal lobe epilepsy, and from here, she'd be placed on a drug known as Zintrapil, an anticonvulsant. And this worked for a time, but as 1969 would progress, she would become very sick. In December, she would contract pneumonia, which would be further complicated by a tuberculosis infection. She became too ill to further attend her studies and was forced to drop out of school at that time. She would remain back at home in her bed until January of 1970, at which point her condition still hadn't improved. So as a result of this, she was transferred to the hospital in February. From here, she was placed in a sanatorium in Middleburg, one that specialized in bronchial and lung disease. She made some improvement there, but would also have other issues diagnosed. When spring came, she longed to go home, to see the beautiful lush hills of her village, instead of the jagged and ominously gray mountains that surrounded her. Unfortunately for her sake, she was not yet permitted to leave. Due to her condition still needing to improve, as well as new diagnoses of cardiovascular circulatory problems. Although sad, Michelle understood what was happening. However, this all too persistent and familiar force that had come to plague her would visit her yet again on June the 3rd of 1970. The same massive, paralyzing entity would grip her with ice cold and unseen hands. This time, however, Annalise tried everything she could to free herself, and in her desperate attempts, a lone scream would finally manage to tear loose from her lips. And this scream was heard by the night nurse, as well as the young doctor that was on duty that night, both of which rushed to her aid. As the two entered the room, the specter released its grip on Michelle. By this point, all of the commotion had woken up the other girls in the wing of the sanatorium that she was in. Michelle would be assisted with changing her pajamas and bedding and tried to sleep under nurse supervision that night. The following morning, the girls' gossip had reached a fever pitch. They began to speculate if Annalise had previously had a head injury or if she had water on the brain. Annalise herself, however, didn't pay much attention to them. She was becoming withdrawn and was still weak from the previous night's episode. She was more concerned with what was going on with her health. As the day progressed and dust settled on the horizon, while the other girls were headed to the cafeteria, Annalise opted to stay in her room, stare out her window, and say her evening rosary. As she prayed, the voices of the returning girls seemed louder than usual. However, what once appeared as massive and foreboding mountains appeared more beautiful this time. Their peaks glistened with pink and violet as the sun hit them. 
One of the girls would approach her as she was admiring and praying and would ask if she was all right. She then would comment on her blue eyes being black. Annalise, unsure of what to make of this, shook off the girl's remarks. She would go on to finish her rosary. The following day, she would be sent to another specialist who would attempt to figure out just what was going on inside of her head. After a day's worth of tests, including EEGs yet again, they would find no evidence of anything being wrong. However, with her now documented history of epileptic seizures, the doctor, Dr. Keller, would recommend a new anticonvulsive drug be prescribed to her. Upon returning to the sanatorium, Annalise would begin to experience a new and terrifying manifestation. In her normal waking life, she would begin to see horrible, demonic-looking creatures that were seemingly stalking her from the shadows. They would appear in the mountains, in her corridors, and even in her room. Upon seeing their gnarled faces, she would often fall to her knees and beg the Virgin Mary for grace to make these terrible visions go away. After six more weeks at the sanatorium, she would be examined once again by a physician and again have more tests ran and yet again she would be found to have no abnormalities in her brain scans. With this conclusion, she would finally be allowed to return home to her family. Her return home was happy at first, being back in her own bed, surrounded by familiar faces. But yet Michelle found herself soon worrying about going back to school and readjusting, and of course, about her persistent health problems. However, she would end up returning to school to finish. This time, of course, she would be visited by multiple doctors all throughout the year to monitor her health. She would have several more seizures, although seemingly not as severe as the ones previously experienced. And although those had seemed to be pretty minor, she was still experiencing horrific, disfigured visions. She began to share this with her mother, and after time and time again of the doctors not finding anything abnormal about her, Anna began to think that something supernatural was taking place. One evening, the two parents discussed this matter in particular. Anna tried to convince her husband that what was plaguing their daughter was of the devil. She told him that Annalise had been seeing horrible and twisted faces all throughout the day and night, sometimes in the mirror or looking out a window, or even through the faces of other people. One vision in particular that Annalise had relayed to her mother disturbed her so much that she had to share it with her husband, Joseph. Annalise had told her that upon seeing the statue of the Virgin Mary in their living room, on their mantle, that her eyes turned black. A hideous grin appeared on her face, and her small, delicate hands began to twitch and then morph into thick, grotesque claws. Seeing the sincerity in his wife's eyes, Joseph, although silent for a few minutes, decided that the family should ask for guidance through prayer. With school finally finished for Annalise before university, a summer trip was in order. After consulting with the doctors about his daughter's condition and discovering her depressive thoughts that she had shared with them, Joseph decided to take his daughter to the shrine of San Damiano in Italy in hopes of not only aiding her spiritually, but hopefully mentally as well. The shrine had been created by a woman named Rosa Quattrini, who over time experienced multiple miracles and received messages from the Virgin Mary, including to have the shrine built. Later becoming known as Mama Rosa, she would work alongside Padre Pio for many years. So in due time, with the assistance of a teacher, they organized a trip to the shrine and were on a bus headed through the Italian countryside. Upon their arrival and exiting of the bus, amidst the beautiful vineyards that surrounded the location of the garden in which the shrine was located in, a dark presence would envelop Annalise. Surrounding the shrine was an open space which allowed for pilgrims to kneel and pray. A small crowd was present as Annalise approached the shrine at the insistence of her father. However, she seemed like she couldn't approach the Holy Mother. She began to walk around the shrine in a wide arc 
and to her, her feet began to burn, as if she was walking on hot coals, and each person she glanced at, although in the praying position, were gnashing their teeth, and their faces were distorted and awful. This is where she began to really first display her aversion to holy objects, such as medals of saints, statues, and insignia that represented Jesus Christ. Those present couldn't help but notice how strange the young woman was behaving, and upon heading back onto the bus, she was then being asked by the teacher, a woman named Frau Hein, about what was going on with her. She expressed that her will was not her own, and that someone else was manipulating her. Almost as soon as those words left Michelle's mouth, her personality would completely change. In a voice that sounded like a man's, Annalise began to belittle Frau Hein, making fun of her for being unsure of herself. She then snatched a blessed medal off of her neck. Simultaneously, Frau, Joseph, and others present on the trip began to smell a stench exuding from Annalise, unlike anything they had ever experienced before. The smell was that of fecal matter and something burning, and it permeated the entire bus. She would eventually calm down, and the occupants would return back to their native Germany. After their visit to San Damiano, Annalise seemed to feel quite well despite what had taken place, but this would only last for about two weeks. She was set to attend college for the first time in several weeks' time, but felt that she was in no condition to do so, and she complained to her mother that she was horribly depressed and constantly plagued by these horrible faces. Believing it to be a result of her daughter's seizures, Anna would make an appointment with Dr. Luthi. Several days later, Annalise would troop to that very appointment. It would be determined that she had been seizure-free in between their appointments together, and another EEG would determine that her brain was indeed normal. However, Dr. Luthi, who was non-religious, would essentially belittle Annalise for telling him that she was seeing these horrible visions on a daily basis now. He believed, personally, that she was an overly superstitious Catholic girl. And with this, he would clear Annalise to go to university. This would be the last time that she would see Dr. Luthi, and the last time she would mention the demons to any medical professional. Becoming more depressed and withdrawn, her mother would finally confront Annalise, telling her that her whole life she's wanted to be a teacher, and now that the opportunity is here, she's not taking it. Annalise would explain that she was depressed, empty, and tired, that the drugs were not helping her, and that the demons and their manifestations were only getting worse. Still considering her daughter's issues to possibly be spiritual in nature, Anna would arrange for her to begin meeting with priests in an effort to aid her. The two priests that would begin to receive letters from both Anna and Annalise were Father Herman and Father Alt. After reading the letters, their interest not only piqued by the descriptions of what poor Annalise was experiencing, but Father Alt began to feel very ill, seemingly out of nowhere. After this happened, he would retire back to his dormitory room for the night and would try to sleep it off. Shortly after the clock struck midnight, Father Alt would awake soaked and in a cold sweat. A storm reached outside. Lightning illuminated the room around him. As he laid in his bed, feeling awful, he began to pray. But as he prayed, he would feel someone or something press on his bed as if they had walked onto it. This deeply frightened the father as he jumped off his bed, began to pray out loud. As the words left his mouth, a horrendous, burning smell began to fill his room. Alt then rushed out of his door and into the hallway. His vision began to narrow and his color perception was changing as he rushed down the stairs and headed toward the exit door of the building. Within the shadows cascading on the walls and the stained glass that surrounded him, horrible, distorted faces began to reveal themselves. Father Alt now knew that what he was dealing with was indeed very real, evil forces. He would run outside and into the rain, falling to his knees and gripping his rosary as he attempted to catch his breath. 
He would eventually return back to his room once he felt that the force had passed. However, the scent of burning fecal matter still filled the entire parish. Even the following day, it was still there and would be experienced by all of the priests and staff. This event would further the interest in Annalise's case and further motivate the priests to act quickly, fearing that the young woman was indeed being affected by the demonic. Father Alt would begin to meet with Annalise when he could and it would accommodate her school schedule. At this particular point, she seemed to be doing fairly good despite still seeing the manifestations most days. She would begin classes on November 1st of 1973, going to lectures day in and day out, and seeking various churches and chapels to relax and pray in as she remained a diligent student. And her life, despite these awful visions that bothered her still, was about to change. At the end of November, Annalise would meet a fellow student by the name of Peter. He was somewhat like herself, he was very shy and friendly, but was outgoing when you got to know him. The two shared many classes together and would soon fall in love. Several weeks into their relationship, however, Annalise would tell Peter to stop seeing her, fearing that when the demons came back, he wouldn't want her anyways. But despite what his new girlfriend was telling him, Peter denied this and still refused to leave her side. Soon after this, Annalise would go in for a checkup evaluation, where she would have an EEG yet again, except this time, the doctor administering the EEG, a woman named Dr. Schleip, would find patterns of epilepsy. This is significant because this is the first time out of all of the other times that any patterns of epilepsy had ever been found. As a result of this, Dr. Schleip would change Annalise's medication to yet another anticonvulsant drug known as Delontin, in hopes that it would improve her condition. Following this appointment, Peter and Annalise would continue their relationship, in which Annalise would confide in Peter, more so about what she was experiencing with the demonic figures and faces that still plagued her. Peter had also become aware of the awful stench that seemed to follow her, especially when she was experiencing these supposed hallucinations. And as their relationship progressed, he wanted her to join him in meeting his family and friends, but Annalise refused, worrying that they may not be as understanding as Peter. Michelle would ultimately express that she did have moments of clarity where she did feel like herself, but every so often, those devils would reappear. And despite taking her medication daily, rigorously, the faces would remain. And soon coupled with the faces, she would begin to experience debilitating headaches. Father Alt, checking in on her with the local bishop there on campus, would discuss that her complaints and ailments continued to be the same, despite her taking her medication every single day. He would arrange to have Annalise meet him in a nearby town for the two to pray together. Peter would ultimately take Annalise to this appointment and would be surprised at how quickly she seemed relieved after the two began praying. Although very skeptical, Peter began to believe that possibly this could be a spiritual problem. I did want to take a moment here and say that there's so much information about what happened to Annalise in her life, and I've been pretty thorough up to this point, but I'm going to do a few briefer sections leading up to the paranormal manifestations that worsened her life, just because if I sat here on every painstaking detail, we'd be here all day. Following the meeting with Father Alt, Annalise's depression would return. She told Peter that the clanking of knives and forks sickened her, that the demons wouldn't let her eat. Coupled with her losing weight and becoming ever more reclusive, other witnesses to the strange behavior she exhibited began to grow as well. One incident in particular, a mutual friend of both Annalise and Peter named Anna Leipert witnessed something that she would never forget. In July of 1975, with Anna, Annalise, and Peter sitting in Annalise's dorm room, having a casual conversation, suddenly, out of nowhere, Annalise's face contracted and contorted into something demonic in appearance. Her entire body then went stiff as a board, as if she was entering a catatonic state. Obviously freaked out by this, Anna asked Peter what was happening, and Peter simply replied, 
it's the demons. She's under possession. Not knowing what else to do, the two prayed with Michelle, and it would take an hour and a half for this episode to be over. Following this happening, it became clear that Annalise could no longer be by herself and attend school. The two would reach out to her parents, and several days later, they would move the young woman back to Klingenberg. Upon arriving, Annalise was able to start eating again, but her other problems continued unabated. If anything, they worsened greatly in a very short period of time. During a phone call between Father Alt and Michelle's mother, the two would be interrupted frequently by the horrendous screams of Annalise in her room, screaming obscenities and overall acting abhorrent. Father Alt would ask a fellow priest closer to Annalise to assist him in aiding her spiritual battle, a man named Father Roth. Upon reaching out to the family to arrange his meeting with them, Father Roth was surprised when Annalise's mother answered the phone and said, Father Roth? The two had never met before, nor had she been previously informed that Father Roth was going to call. Bewildered, he said, yes, that's me. He was then informed that Annalise had told her that he was going to phone. That right there to the priest was an indication of the demonic, knowledge of the unknown. He would arrive a week later, and upon entering the house, he could hear the girl scream from her room above. A horrible stench, like something burning, like dung and sulfur filled the room that he and Mrs. Michelle chatted in, the main living room of the house. Trying to find the source of the scent, he checked all the other rooms. He checked outside, in the kitchen, everything that he could think of, and yet he could find no explainable origin for this horrible smell. Mrs. Michelle would inform him that Annalise had been in the living room roughly 20 minutes before his arrival. Stepping outside to avoid the scent, the two would chat further, and Father Roth would be informed of Annalise's outbursts of rage and all around her bizarre behavior. The family would beg him to pray over her, to which he agreed. Reluctantly walking upstairs to Annalise's room for the first time, he couldn't help but notice the abnormal amount of dead bugs that lined the hallway. Upon opening the door, he would be besieged by the girl. She began cursing at him, screaming at the top of her lungs, telling him to not dare take the crucifix out of his pocket, which he had not told anyone that he was carrying. She ran out of the bed and up to his face, suddenly stopping an inch or two away, as if she was frozen. Her eyes blackened, and she said, O oh priest, you may try. She then collapsed to the floor in a catatonic state. This was more than enough for Father Roth to rush to arrange a meeting with Father Alt to discuss what exactly had taken place. Within two days, they would meet in person, to which Father Roth would explain that he had no doubts that the girl was being troubled by demons, that he had no doubt that it was indeed the real deal. Therefore, the two together would seek to move forward with a formal permission to begin the exorcism process. During the wait for the final set approval, the course of the next year would weave a web of disgust and horror as her family, Peter, and the priests would experience a plethora of horrendous manifestations at the hands of Annalise. Following Father Roth's initial visit, Annalise had become extremely restless. At most, she was only sleeping one, maybe two hours a night. She would run through the house on all fours, barking and screaming like an animal. She would visibly be forcibly moved by something that she couldn't see. During her prayers, which were constant at this point, she would do knee busters, standing up and kneeling down at the expense of her knees. No matter how awfully she injured them, they were becoming swollen and ulcerated. She would nonetheless continue to do this. She would scream constantly. The incessant yelling echoed all throughout the walls day and night, rising and falling like waves against a rocky shore. She would tremble and twitch, becoming rigid and catatonic, 
having to be moved back into her bed by Peter and her family. Alongside the ever-worsening madness, weighing a hundred pounds at most at this point, she began to exhibit superhuman strength. Peter would watch her crush an apple with one frail hand and throw her sister, Rosvitha, across the room like a rag doll. She also began to smash her face into walls and floors, leading to her mother placing pillows all around in an effort to stop her from injuring herself. With the Michelle family's world turning upside down, Annalise stopped eating and drinking altogether. Normal food, that is. She began to stuff the overabundance of insects into her mouth, eating roaches, hordes of flies, and spiders. Further, her behavior became more unhinged. She began to chew on coal and rocks, which ultimately broke several of her teeth. Among the chaos, her family began to experience what can only be described as paranormal manifestations themselves. Clouds of flies would appear and disappear at random all over their home, and in the dead of winter, they began to see shadowy figures that would be running all throughout their home and watching them around every corner and out of the corner of their eyes. This, of course, would deeply frighten them. As Annalise raged on, her family and Peter took to alternating two-hour shifts in order to take care of her to the best of their ability in an attempt to prevent her from inflicting more wounds upon herself. Joseph knew things, given how awful they were, could not continue the way that they were going. So he soon, out of desperation, phoned Father Alt and began begging for his assistance. Father Alt, who had been in touch with his superiors at the church, would inform him that he believed Annalise should be admitted to a psychiatric hospital for evaluation. However, upon sharing the slew of details that were shared with him by Joseph, at the dramatic worsening of Annalise's behavior and overall condition with a fellow priest by the name of Father Rodvik. Father Rodvik agreed to go and see the girl for himself. Upon entering the Michelle house, he would be introduced to Annalise through her father, who had walked her into the living room by himself on account that she had become very violent towards herself and family members by this point. Sitting down beside her, Father Rodvik asked her, What is your name? Her response, in a very low, altered voice that was not her own, was Judas. Over the course of the next several hours, the father was able to have a normal conversation with Annalise as she went from being under an outside influence to herself, having no recollection of the latter. Then, towards the end of the meeting, she would slap the father across the face and then stand up, walk towards the piano, and begin playing it as if nothing had ever happened. Father Rodvik informed the family that he would indeed help her and support them, and that he ultimately believed Annalise to be possessed and would seek action immediately. After much deliberation, the church finally came around. A priest by the name of Father Renz, an experienced exorcist, would be tasked with the ritual, and on a cold and rainy day, it would begin. September 24th, 1975, he would arrive at the Michelle residence. After discussing the plan with her family, he would proceed up the stairs and walk into the viper's den that was Annalise's room. He would be joined by Joseph, Peter, and a volunteer from their local congregation who wanted to assist. At first, all was quiet, even silent. Annalise, or rather the demons, were not engaging Father Renz, but when he began the ritual, he sprinkled holy water on Annalise, and she began to shake and scream. She started to bite the men who were holding her, lunging at the priest. She attempted to attack him. It would take all three additional men to hold her down. We draw what we know what happened from an entry in Father Renz's diary. He would go on to say that she would sound like a man, speak Latin, and eventually be reduced to a catatonic state, following an all-too-familiar pattern from what we already know. Knowing that he had a long battle ahead of him, the priest was saddened that the first ritual had not been successful. He would leave for the night, 
but would ultimately return four days later on September the 28th in the evening. He then brought with him a recorder in hopes of providing a record for future study within the church. Due to this decision by Father Renz, we now have some of the most disturbing audio I've maybe ever heard, and I've heard a lot of, of crazy stuff. This is just a portion of what he recorded. Annalise would again repeat the chaotic behavior that was exhibited within the first exorcism, and the devil that resided within her began to rebuttal the priest in Latin, as well as her native tongue of German. Although being familiar with the Latin language, Annalise was not fluent, let alone fluent enough to have been able to rebuttal a priest in real time who spoke the language fluently. As the priest inquired as to why the girl was being tormented, it, whatever it was, replied with, she was cursed before she was born by a woman, a neighbor of her mother. Annalise's parents and Peter would later check this story out, but the woman had since passed away, so they weren't able to come up with anything conclusive. This second exorcism would last for hours and would end with a haunting sentence from Annalise herself. She would say, damned for all eternity. She would then curl back up into a catatonic state, like a statue. Now, we only have some details here and there based on the diary entries, interviews, and audio recordings, but this would ultimately continue for months. Annalise would undergo 67 exorcisms in total. She would reveal that she was possessed by five demons, and their names were Cain, Judas, Nero, Fleischmann, and Lucifer the devil in the flesh. There is one more demon, but it's a name that I feel like if I say it on YouTube, I will probably get demonetized. You can look it up for yourself. Just simply go to her Wikipedia page, which I will also be linking down in the comments below. Cain, known from the Bible as the first murderer, the originator of violence. Judas, as in Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Christ. Nero, the crazed Roman emperor who tortured Christians for his own sick enjoyment. Fleischmann, who was a disgraced priest local to the land. And finally Lucifer, the prince of darkness himself. Her physical decline due to not being able to eat, self-inflicted injuries, and psychosis due to lack of sleep would finally take their toll. She would inform Father Rents on June 30th at the end of what would be their final exorcism, that she had spoken with the Virgin Mary and that she had agreed to stay on earth and suffer through the demons to prove to people who didn't believe in God that the devil was very real. She would then ask for absolution in which Father Rince would grant her. That night, she would go silent for the first time since all of these horrifying episodes had began. And the following morning, Around 7 a.m. on July the 1st of 1976, she would be found dead in her bed. All of the exorcisms and attempts to drive the demons out had failed, and upon her death, she only weighed roughly 85 pounds. Annalise had gone from a shy but happy girl with her whole life ahead of her to an emaciated shell of herself. Just how did we get here? Was it malpractice? Was she mentally ill? 
or was it truly the hands of the demonic that snuffed her out? After multiple calls had been made by her grieving family, a man named Dr. Keller would perform the post-mortem examination, and it's important to note the following details because honestly it's really intriguing. Her death was determined to be caused by starvation and possibly aggravated and tremendous physical exertion in the final weeks of her life. He would find that her inner organs surprisingly were healthy and not damaged, as well as her brain, which showed no signs of epilepsy, not even on a microscopic level. Curiously still, no bruising, bed sores, or ulcerations were found on her skin. In the ensuing aftermath, the priests were arrested and charged with negligent homicide, as well as Joseph and Anna. The trial and case overall would become a highly debated issue among the German people of the time, with some being convinced that she died at the hands of Satan himself, and others that it was the fault of malpractice on behalf of the priests and her parents. The trial would last for months, with doctors weighing in with their opinions, lawyers, witnesses, and just the whole works. And although I have those details here, there is so much to it, just the trial itself, that honestly, I would probably have to make a whole other video in total just to cover it. The verdict, however, in my opinion, is the important part of what followed her death. After a much heated debate, ultimately, Michelle's parents and the priests involved would be charged with negligent homicide and would be sentenced to six months in prison. The six months, ultimately, would be reduced to three years of probation, as well as a fine given the unique circumstances of the case. The church would draw a ton of heat as a result of what happened. They would ultimately retract the confirmation that Annalise Michelle was indeed possessed. Michelle had been buried under hurried circumstances, and as a result of this, as well as multiple religious people sharing that they had visions of her body untouched by decay, she would be exhumed almost two years later, with the intention being to have her buried in a nicer coffin. Her family and friends were discouraged from viewing her remains because they were consistent with the decay of a corpse of that age. In the end, her case would go on to achieve worldwide notoriety and would force the Catholic Church to all but never issue sanctioned exorcisms. And on June 6th of 2013, the home in which her exorcisms took place in mysteriously caught fire and would burn to the ground. The police suspected arson, but never ultimately proved it, but many locals believed that it was a result of what had taken place there. And really, it's hard telling. Decades after her death, her story would go on to inspire multiple films and books, including The Exorcism of Emily Rose, being the most popular, and honestly fairly accurate with some liberties to the original story. And of many of those books, the best and most utilized resource of them, for me, has been The Exorcism of Annalise Michelle by Felicitas D. Goodman. All, and I mean all details you could ever want about the entire case, are available in this book, and I would highly recommend it. In conclusion, Annalise's case remains a terrifying and mysterious one. Was she demonically possessed or incredibly mentally ill? Did her priests and parents genuinely help her? and being freed from Satan's grasp? Or did they contribute to the end of her life accidentally? Really, the final conclusion is yours to make. But regardless of the cause, I'm glad that her suffering is over, and I pray now that she can hopefully rest in peace. Thank you guys so much for watching this new video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like, subscribe with notifications on, and if you're already subscribed, Go ahead and turn notifications on. Uh, it helps me out a ton. Please also leave a comment letting me know what you thought of the story. Uh, your thoughts on basically the new, a newer format I'm trying out. I'm trying to do kind of like a half and half thing. I'm trying to find ways where I can speed up making content for you guys and just try and find a happy medium and uh, get you guys more content and better content. So let me know what you think for sure. And I highly appreciate your feedback. This case took a really long time. I mean, like probably like two, three weeks to research. And I really hope that I did Annalise's story justice 
And I hope you guys learned some stuff that maybe you wouldn't have known before or otherwise. Anyways, I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. And I will see you next time. This has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. Remember to stay safe out there and take care. Many homes have been given the title of Demon House, many of which I have covered here on this channel, but this house, out of all of them, has truly earned the moniker. From the time the soil was dug up during the Victorian era, a curse seemed to be placed upon the land, and when you combine terrible happenings with occult rituals, it's truly a recipe for disaster the results of which have produced a cornucopia of paranormal activity within this now infamous Indiana home. This is the untold story of the frightening Monroe Demon House. Join me as I attempt to uncover its supernatural secrets. With the ever-changing algorithmic favor of YouTube, please, if you enjoy my content, leave a like, a comment, and subscribe. Thank you all. Information available on this property is scarce at best, but I've done my best to find out as much as I could to try and provide you with the most cohesive picture possible. Hartford City, Indiana. What was started as a small log cabin settlement continued to grow and eventually hit the big time in the late 1880s, where itself and its neighbors entered a natural gas boom, resulting in many factories being created during industrialization. Factories that produced textiles, glass, and other goods. But although natural resources were widely abundant within the ground there, something else seemed to inhabit the soil. Our story begins at the construction site of a rather unsuspecting looking Victorian home. The year is 1892, and the Berger family, who emigrated to the area from Belgium, had been successful in their business endeavors, and thus thought a new home in their new country would be the ultimate earthly reward. However, the family's newfound happiness would be all but short-lived. From the time the earth was dug up and the new home erected, within months, John Berger, the patriarch of the family, would die from tuberculosis within its walls. Mourning his death, this would be far from the last tragedy his family would endure moving forward. Shortly after John's death, a fire would mysteriously start in the upstairs level of the house, in time destroying a large portion of the property, and the majority of the Berger family would meet a truly gruesome and terrible fate. Following the horrific fire that torched what little happiness the Berger family had left, the widow of the family and one surviving child desperately needed a source of income. So the widowed Mrs. Berger decided to start renting out rooms in order to make it. There would be various tenants, but the most prominent were the Myers family. The head of the household, a man named Ulysses Myers, was a well-known and respected member of the community. He was known for his kindness, compassion, and for being an all-around amazing family man. But this reputation would soon fade. Shortly after moving into the home, Ulysses slowly began to change. Those who knew him believed that he had done a complete shift in his entire personality, all just within months. So much so that he became unrecognizable, not only to his close friends, but to his family as well. His kindness, compassion, and care all seemed to have been buried, and someone new now greeted them each day behind the eyes of Ulysses. He quickly became prone to fits of rage and insanity. 
This led him to become abusive towards his once beloved family, verbally as well as physically. These new bursts of rage, however, weren't reserved strictly for his family. He soon turned on friends and colleagues, too. This sudden heel turn for Myers led him to losing his job after an altercation at his workplace. And shortly after this, despite how much he had cherished his family before, he stole what was left of his family's money and abandoned his wife and children by skipping town with a newfound mistress. All of which was the polar opposite of the man that they thought they knew. Shattered beyond repair, the Myers family were left with open wounds upon their hearts and confusion in their minds. The only differing factor from their life before to what it was now was the fact that they had moved into this house. Now with the home claiming the destruction of two families, rumors quickly began to spread locally throughout Hartford City that the house contained some kind of curse. Whether it was upon the property or the land was uncertain. The Myers family soon moved out, and due to the rumors, Mrs. Berger was unable to keep tenants to help support her and her surviving child. Thus, she was forced to sell the property at a fire sale rate in order to start somewhere new. What happened to the Bergers is unknown. With this sale, a revolving door of tenants and owners would begin. As soon as one family would move in, they would almost immediately move out. Again and again, this cycle would continue. It would go from being lived in by a family to being rented out and built onto eventually creating its triplex design that we know today. Those who had moved in and out often reported experiencing bizarre activity, and others simply just didn't say anything, possibly not wanting to come to grips with the reality of what they had been through. This ever-changing list of tenants would continue for decades. Along with this revolving door of people, came a revolving door of peculiar behaviors and practices. Rumors began to circulate in the late 1980s and into the early 1990s that tenants during this time frame were performing occult rituals and ceremonies within the home, particularly within the basement. Black magic rituals and ceremonies. Those conducting them attempted to harness the negative energy that dwelled there, to conjure a demon to do their bidding. Although information is limited, one could assume that perhaps their efforts were successful. From the mid-90s onward, the strangeness that surrounds the house on Monroe Street only intensified, with new stories coming from new tenants and neighbors alike. Stories that this old, Victorian home housed a dark and malevolent force. These stories soon began to spread like wildfire. Those who would move into the house typically would only last in the home a year or less. They often fled in the middle of the night, with nothing but the clothes upon their backs, only continuing to solidify that something evil dwelled within the house. Things in fact got so bad that even when the home was abandoned for a time, the windows would be blacked out in order to keep people from looking inside. But not because of vandalism problems, but due to so many neighbors and passerbys calling the police, claiming that they kept seeing shadowy figures walk around the interior of the Monroe house. With the home providing a plethora of paranormal evidence, and experiences. This soon drew the attention of paranormal scholars and investigation groups from all over the country. This is just some of the activity said to have been experienced by various groups over the years. People have reported a vast amount of supernatural happenings, many of which have been caught on film, photo, or digital audio recording. 
These range from aggressive and insulting EVPs or electronic voice phenomena to full-bodied apparitions, shadow figures, and possibly in human manifestations. Mysterious sounds like knocking, banging, and footsteps are common. Doors and cabinets slamming shut with incredible amounts of force. And most of the activity seems to be centered around the basement as well as the top floor. And the top floor is speculated to be the place where the fire had started that engulfed the Berger family. The basement, of course, is where the alleged black magic rituals took place. In both of these locations, an eerie shadowy specter of an old malicious woman is said to attack people. But just who could this entity be? Someone who had previously lived there? Or something inhuman cloaking itself in some kind of familiar skin? Stories of groups panicking and fleeing, too, have become commonplace. One paranormal group, which wishes to remain anonymous, in 2014 had such a disturbing experience that they fled the home in fear for their lives. They arrived on site at the Monroe House amidst a strong thunderstorm. Unpacking their vehicle, attempting to keep their equipment dry and safe, they made their way inside and in due time began documenting whatever they could find there. As they investigated, asking questions, provoking interaction, and recording level by level, the more activity they began to experience. Shadows moved out of the corner of their eyes, bangs, knocking, and cabinets slamming shut could be discerned from the reverb of the thunder outside. But it's when they decided to go down to the basement that their lives would be altered forever. As they descended the stairs, an eerie cold began to overtake them. As they asked their questions, attempting to catch any activity they could, their flashlights and devices failed. Left with only the enveloping darkness, with the occasional flash of lightning coming through the basement windows, something appeared to them that caused them to flee immediately. But just what, or who, was this apparition? This cannot be confirmed. Whatever it was terrified them so much that they fled into the torrential downpour and refused to ever return. Later, when asked for details, even separately, the members of the group thus far have refused to discuss the incident further. Whether this is out of fear for whatever this thing is or was, re-entering their lives, or the mere thought is so reality-shattering, one cannot be sure. This incident and its aftermath truly makes you wonder just what they could have saw within the dilapidated, damp basement that accursed night. Investigations will continue with multiple groups coming in and out until a very peculiar discovery took place in 2016. And this discovery would lead to much speculation as to what could have happened within the house. While conducting an investigation for their show Paranormal Lockdown, Nick Groff and Katrina Weirdman found themselves in the basement and were slowly being drawn to the crawl space of the house. As they traversed the damp darkness, what they would find would alter the story forever. Located within the crawl space were human remains, bones buried in a shallow grave. This freaked the entire crew out and prompted them to stop filming and to call the police immediately. From here, a full-scale investigation would be conducted and the remains excavated and sent to a local coroner there in Indiana for further examination. The bones were indeed confirmed to be human and were, quote, at least a hundred years old, possibly older. Following the coroner, 
they were sent to Indiana University for further testing to determine the age and identification of the person. At this point, the final outcome has not yet been reported, such as the age of the individual found, or their identity, or potential cause of death. The presumed investigation is still underway. This put a brief pause on people being allowed to enter the now privately owned home. But that pause has since been lifted, with many more investigations taking place over the years since. And with these investigations, even more paranormal activity and aggressive activity at that has been reported. These investigations also range from amateur to professional, from the average Joe to YouTubers and famous paranormal teams. Those who have entered the walls of the Monroe Demon House have experienced, in addition to previously mentioned activity, strange sights, smells, and feelings, demonic snarls, growls, and even full-blown attacks have happened, and these have involved scratching, biting, and being shoved. Oftentimes, these more intense manifestations are accompanied with aggressive and commanding EVPs, where people's names are often used. Windows slamming shut with so much force that they shatter, leaving fragments of glass all over the floor, just like the fragments left of the lives of the families who once dwelled there has also happened. One previous owner of the home allegedly even jumped out a window on the top floor upon being attacked by a demonic apparition. Imagine that for a moment. You're so terrified that you would rather risk diving through a window at the top of your house, breaking it ultimately, let alone falling however far and injuring yourself out of pure fear and fight or flight instead of dealing with whatever this thing was that was attacking you, rushing towards you. That to me is bone chilling. Others who have stayed more recently have also reported puddles of strange liquid throughout the house at varying times and with seemingly no origin. Horrific nightmares if they manage to sleep. And why you would ever choose to sleep there is beyond me. And even strange footprints or paw prints such as this one have also been discovered multiple times. So with all of these high strangeness manifestations, we must ask ourselves, just what is it that lurks within the Monroe Demon House? Could it have been a curse placed upon the land, something that predated the building of the house? It's certainly possible, in my opinion, to somewhat back up that claim. Native American artifacts, such as arrowheads, have been found around the property, but nothing significant that would indicate some kind of a curse. No burial grounds or mounds from what I could find. What if it was a generational or family curse? Again, it's possible, but seems somewhat unlikely from what I've seen. The Berger family up until the home was built had great success in their endeavors and for all intents and purposes seemed happy and thriving until, of course, they weren't. Then there's the enigma of the Myers family. Did Ulysses Myers lose his mind due to the home? One could certainly make that connection, considering his complete shift in personality. But what was it in particular that caused him to change so drastically? This question, and more, we may never truly be able to answer. All we can do is speculate. Then, the numerous owners and tenants over the decades since the days of the Bergers and Myers, many of them reporting odd and often scary paranormal or poltergeist activity. Was this activity also taking place when the older families lived there, or did it start after their departure? If this was the case, if it started afterwards, was it the result of negative events? 
attracting something dark? Or was one of the families or family members involved in the occult? And speaking of occult, just who or what were those people in the late 80s and to the early 90s doing? What kind of black magic or rituals were conducted? And were they responsible for conjuring some kind of entity into the home? Or did their practices just make the entire situation much worse? And did it have anything to do with the human remains that were found in the basement? And if not the black mages closer to modern times? Someone in the early 1900s had to have known just who this person was and what happened to them. And of course, will the identity and cause of death ever be determined for the poor soul whose remains were found within the basement. As you ponder all of these questions and attempt to draw your own conclusions, I want to leave you with several final questions. Will the activity ever cease? And will the origin ever truly be determined? All of these questions honestly may not have answers. Perhaps they're out of our scope of understanding, or perhaps the answers have just simply been lost to the sands of time. The one thing I can say for certain is this. Given how many people have experienced dark and spine-tingling paranormal activity within this house, and taking into account how long it has been occurring, this is one home that has truly earned the name The Demon House. Because a demon is precisely what may just be lurking within its depths. Curiosity is a fascinating element of the human condition. Our innate impulse for discovery has led countless souls to scale the heights of mountains and dive into the deepest abysses. But can curiosity be dangerous? Can we stumble upon something we shouldn't have in our explorations into the unknown? Consider the case of former NASA engineer Bill Vail, who after a chance encounter with a strange ritual, finds himself plagued by a merciless evil that threatens to ruin his life. Yet, he is just as haunted by a burning desire to know the truth about what is tormenting him. Today, we will be exploring the untold story of Bill Vail here on Mystery Archives. Please don't forget to like this video and subscribe with notifications on so you never miss a new upload. All that stuff helps me out a bunch, so thank you. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, is an independent organization affiliated with the U.S. government. Since its founding in 1958, the agency has broadened humanity's understanding of the heavens and the dark void that waits just outside of our planet. It is an agency that from the beginning has attracted curious souls, including Bill Vale. Bill had long worked in fields that required not just an intelligent or curious mind, but a logical one. Bill had worked as a sonar supervisor on a nuclear submarine, spent years as a pilot, and a robotics engineer. He worked as an operations quality manager for a company that produced spaceflight critical hardware for NASA. All of these jobs required attention to detail and keen observation. All of them required close attention to surroundings and the ability to remain calm under intense pressure. He was gifted with a driving sense to know. He never guessed. Instead, he would learn and do research in order to truly understand. He was a man driven by relentless curiosity. Bill and his family were not people who were easily spooked, and his friends would come to him if they wanted a straight and clear-cut rational story about anything. However, Bill would find his life taking a sudden turn when he and his wife finalized their divorce in 2002 
Feeling burned out and needing a fresh start in life, Bill quit his job in the aerospace industry and moved back to his hometown in Arlington, Texas to be with his little brother Bob and reconnect after many years. He searched around for something, anything different to do with his life. He found an ad for a job at the same water purification company where his brother worked and decided to roll the dice and take the opportunity. And during this time, he looked for a house and found one that was well within his budget. The deal seemed almost too good to be true. It was like they were trying to give the house away. Early, during Bill's employment at his new job, his employer had received a call from a client asking for someone to be at her house at exactly 5 p.m. Not a minute earlier, or a minute after, but exactly on time. Wanting to prove his competence to his fellow co-workers, Bill went ahead and accepted the job. He kept an eye on his watch as he drove through the suburban streets of Arlington to make sure that he would arrive right on schedule. When he reached his destination, outside of an ordinary looking home, the first noises he heard upon approaching the door were the screams of a woman coming from inside. Raising an eyebrow and feeling that something wasn't quite right and hoping that they would just cancel the appointment altogether, he went ahead and walked to the front door at exactly 5 p.m. Upon knocking, at first there didn't appear to be any sort of an interruption in the woman's yelling. However, through the muffled screams, he was able to unmistakably make out, in the name of Christ, I command you to leave these men, which he thought was peculiar to say the least. Then the door opened. A strange woman stood in the small crack that had now been created, with just a blank expression on her face, without saying a word. She pointed a long bony finger at him and then slammed the door. A feeling of strangeness and dread overtook Bill and he went ahead and ran to his company vehicle as fast as his legs could carry him. He then would call his employer and tell him that he would never take a call from this client again. As he went about his day, he couldn't help shake the events from earlier in the day from his mind. Against his own rational judgment, he felt as though the woman had been trying to warn him in some strange way. After his shift ended that evening, he went home and got settled in for the night. Bill was sound asleep when he felt himself jolted awake by what he thought was an earthquake. His bed shook violently, almost to the point of knocking him off of it. Then, as suddenly as it had began, the shaking stopped. Still in a daze, but now wide awake, Bill set about attempting to see just what had happened. Nothing else in his house appeared to have been shaken by the quake. The clocks in his home read around 3 a.m., and he wasn't terribly convinced that it was in fact an earthquake that had caused the disturbance. He attempted to recreate the shaking of his bed himself, but was unable to. Deciding that he must have just been dreaming, he went ahead and just laid back down and decided that he would check the following day if an earthquake had indeed happened. However, upon checking the following day, no such quake had occurred. After this incident, doves and other birds would begin gathering in the trees outside of his home, so much so that the realtor who had sold him the house was baffled. He soon started to notice the pervasive, almost smothering smell of bacon in his home which is kind of odd if you think about it, just something cooking, and bacon has a very particular scent. It was as if someone was constantly cooking an entire package on his stove. Walking through mysterious cold spots in his house became a regular occurrence as well. Although Bill would try his best to find a rational explanation, such as something being caused by his air conditioner, or poor insulation, or a draft, nothing he could come up with made rational sense to explain what he was experiencing. At night, he would experience things that would only get darker and more sinister as time went on. He would awake in the early morning hours to the sensation of small creatures, like cats or dogs, running across his feet. But his dogs slept in their kennels at night. When they were out, however, they would also growl and even bark at seemingly nothing at random areas in the house. The activity, however, began so slight that it could easily be ignored. And even if it couldn't be ignored, Bill would try to write it off by finding some sort of a logical explanation. 
and just dismissing it in his mind. However, Bill would soon experience a watershed moment when he was watching TV one evening in his house. Suddenly, he watched as a water bottle, which had been sitting on his kitchen counter, flew across the room and bounced off the wall next to his head. It was at this point that Bill, in all of his logic and experience, finally had to admit that what he was dealing with had to fall under the realm of the paranormal, for he had no other explanation, no other reasoning that would make sense of the months of unseen forces toying with him. However, at this final acceptance that it was something supernatural in nature, the phenomena began to kick into a higher gear. The phenomena deepened beyond just sights and affecting Bill's surroundings. Electronic technicians frequented his house, often due to the constant flickering of lights, failure of his computer, and television, and many of them stated that they had never experienced anything like they did inside Bill's house in their entire careers. Alongside the strange fluctuations in the electricity, Bill's phone also began calling people by itself throughout all odd hours of the night, usually around 3 a.m. Bill called his phone company to attempt to find a solution to the problem, and during his phone call with the representative, a strange and aggressive voice could be heard in the static, speaking in a language that neither of them could understand. The representative confirmed that he had heard it as well and was baffled because they used a secure line that a third party could definitely not access or hijack. While calling his friend Michael, who happened to be a sound engineer, the same voice appeared on the phone line. Bill told Michael to hang up because he believed that there was something evil about this voice, but Michael had already began recording the conversation. However, upon the phone call ending and upon Michael reviewing the audio that he had recorded, no such voice could be found. Bill soon needed more confirmation that other people were seeing what he was seeing so that he could rule out if he was crazy or not. He invited his brother Bob over and asked him to stand in his bedroom closet with the lights off. Bob thought it was an odd request, but he went ahead and agreed and went and stood in his brother's closet with the door closed. Bob would emerge a little while later, a bit disgruntled, but when Bill asked him if he had experienced anything, all he had to say at that time was that I think the closet needs to be cleaned. However, later, Bob would reveal that during his time in the closet, two large boxes had fallen behind him, and the cord for the overhead light had smacked him across the face. It spooked him enough at the time to where he didn't want to speak about it. At one point, when Bob was at Bill's house in his den, sitting at the bar while writing down information for an upcoming appointment of his, he began to hear something rustling around in the trash can and out of his line of sight. He ignored it for a time and soon thought that possibly it could be Bill's dogs that were getting into the trash. So concerned, he stood up and went over to inspect it. However, not only was the trash untouched, but as he passed by to where it was, he noticed that Bill's dogs were all crated in their kennels. On another occasion, he briefly used Bill's house as a pit stop on the way to an appointment, and after using the restroom, Bob noticed that the sway light from the ceiling was moving back and forth quite erratically and on its own. Dismissing it at the time, he thought that it was just the AC unit that was making it move. It was only later, upon asking Bill, that he learned, in fact, that there was no AC unit or ductwork that went anywhere near where that light was. On another night, Bob and his wife were at Bill's house for dinner, and Bill watched the television and saw something move out of the corner of his eyes. He stood up immediately. Wanting to make sure that he wasn't the only one seeing it, he quickly had Bob sit down and watch the TV to see if he noticed anything out of the corner of his eyes. Soon, a look of shock came over Bob's face as he saw something move in his closet. When Bob's wife sat down, she too gasped after a moment as well. All three of them would sketch out what they saw, and they all drew the same thing. A small, two to three feet tall being that looked like an imp. For those unaware, imps are demons from European folklore and myth 
that are depicted as small and mischievous, goblin-like, and they were familiar spirits of witches, or even the devil's personal attendants. After this, Bill told him everything that he had been experiencing, and Bob then offered to let his brother stay with him until they figured out just what exactly was taking place. However, appreciating the offer, Bill decided to decline it. His reasoning was that he felt that if he left, he would be giving in to whatever was tormenting him, like it had won over him. Following these events, his bedroom became a constant source of torment, as the bed would sometimes shake violently, and other times, just enough to keep him awake. Small hands would depress his mattress, and even hit him from underneath. He would feel invisible beings slide into bed next to him, and would often hear loud knocks, bangs, and scratches from inside his walls. He would receive scratches and bruises without explanation, and he then began to see the apparition of a ghost cat, as well as strange cold mists within his house. The home quickly became a place full of a dark and foreboding presence. Bill desperately wanted all of this to stop, to reclaim his home and his life. He began to research the occult, the paranormal, and anything and everything online and in literature that would give him a better understanding of what he was dealing with, and possibly how to remedy it. Meanwhile, the activity was taking a toll on Bill's health. He found himself sick and often taking trips to the hospital more than he was used to. Fearing that whatever this was was not only tormenting him, but also affecting his health, Bill decided to reach out to a paranormal group for help. Going through many teams, Bill declined to work with many of them because they didn't seem scientific in their approach. This was until he found a team known as Did You See That, or DYST, which to Bill had the right kind of logical and rational mindset to properly investigate the beings that had seemingly infested his life. He found their number and dialed it right away. From here, Bill's life would only continue to go down a rabbit hole that he never would have found himself going down otherwise. It was Saturday night when Bill got a knock at his door. For some time now, he had been inviting groups of strangers into his home to investigate the happenings inside of his house. He had seen many come and go, usually only for a night, and none of them were truly able to help. When he opened the door this time, there was only one man standing there to greet him, and his name was Brian Hall, the founder of DYST, a paranormal team that claimed they did not search for ghosts but they searched for answers. Brian founded DYST in 2005 with friends in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in Texas. They performed investigations and posted their findings on MySpace and began to receive emails and calls from people wanting their aid and expertise in the paranormal. Part of DYST's procedure was to begin with a single member of the team giving an assessment of the location before bringing in the rest of the team and any of the equipment. Brian quickly noted the oppressive atmosphere in the house, and once he made his rounds, he gave the okay for the rest of the team to come in and begin the second phase. The team was full of various experts in their fields, with a critical eye for anything that could possibly cause noise or strange phenomena in an ordinary house. They searched the house from top to bottom, and once they were satisfied that they had identified any possible areas of false evidence, they went outside and returned with their equipment. They set up a command post in the living room with cameras and audio recorders throughout the house, trying to pick up anything that could be lurking within its depths. That night, however, was fairly uneventful. After the team had departed with little to go on, Bill called his mother to tell her how the investigation had gone. During the call, Bill heard three distinct knocks, as if the house were declaring its own malevolent victory. Unlike the previous investigator, DYST would eventually return over several months 
to continually probe the home for its dark and sinister secrets. Activity began to reveal itself to the members of the team over time. Shadow people, imps, and even the disembodied apparition of a ghost-like cat were experienced by the crew. On one occasion, the team brought in lasers for a particular experiment. The tech was designed to cast a laser grid in a darkened bedroom. This technique is intended to detect even the slightest movement that might be invisible to the naked eye. The first night came and went with nothing noteworthy happening. The second was much like the first, but the third, when they used the laser grid, Bill, Brian, and the team were sitting in the command center when they all heard a loud crashing noise coming from Bill's bedroom. Upon inspecting the bedroom, they found the laser device on the floor. The device had been thrown by a powerful and unseen force. It had been flung so hard that it had struck the bed, bounced off of it, and then hit a nearby dresser. They first checked the cameras, only to find that their batteries had been drained of all of their power. This was a common occurrence during investigations at the house, and it was a pervasive obstacle to finding any visual evidence. And we often hear this in many paranormal investigations, especially darker ones. For some reason, they tend to drain battery life as if they're feeding off of it. The team noted times to where they could audibly hear the moment that their cameras were switched off by something that they couldn't see. Luckily, they found out that the audio recording devices were still functioning when the phenomena occurred. When they played back the audio, not only did they hear a loud crashing sound, but they heard something else entirely. They heard a disembodied voice say, He's coming back. Time to put it back on. Just before the laser crashed and hit the floor. Despite the lack of visual evidence, Brian was determined to catch the phenomena on video. The next time they arrived at the house, they brought even more cameras and more laser grids. They set up the equipment as before and let the newest teammate, Sean, lay in bed in the master bedroom and he called out into the darkness, if you're there, give us a sign. Within an instant, the laser moved with violent force, causing Sean to cry out in surprise. The rest of the team then rushed into the bedroom to gather the equipment and to assess the evidence. All but one camera had been completely drained of power. The device had been pointing directly at the laser. The footage it caught not only showed the laser being shoved, but a strange mist that formed around the laser, turning it into a violent and aggressive vortex before the activity occurred, and then finally dissipating after its conclusion. During another investigation, Bill and his brother Bob and his wife Cindy would attend, and in addition, he invited a friend, Chuck, and his wife, Melissa. Chuck Kelly had been longtime friends with Bill through golfing. To call him a skeptic to the paranormal would be an understatement. His wife Melissa, however, was a woman who not only believed in the paranormal, but was sensitive to it and that allowed her to see beings that were invisible to the naked eye. For a long time, she had refused to go near Bill's home for this reason. But not knowing that, Chuck eventually confronted her about this, and she said, There's something in that house that's intelligent and evil, something that knows that I know, and I'm afraid of what will happen if I go there. After Bill reached out to Chuck, Chuck told his wife that she needed to speak with him because he needs her help. When she met with Bill, he revealed everything that had been happening. Despite knowing the danger of the entity in his home, Melissa was moved by Bill's plight and agreed to attend the next investigation with Chuck. The day of, she felt apprehension. She sensed that the entity was furious at her coming and wanted to harm her. Her mind's eye saw a beast like that of an ape throwing itself against the walls and windows of the house, daring her to come inside. So with a deep breath, she did. Upon entering and being greeted by Bill, she saw several small and hideous creatures 
at his feet. They stood on two legs, and they looked like hunched over little men. Disturbed, but seeing that no one else was noticing these beings, she ignored them as best as she could and continued her journey through the home. When she got to Bill's bedroom, she said that the imps were at their most comfortable in his room and played across the furniture and on the floor. Halfway into the room, however, she froze. She searched every corner of the room wide-eyed and with her hair standing on end. She sensed something horrible and intelligent lurking out of her sight and out of the corner of the room in the closet. She didn't want to know what it was, and honestly, I can't blame her. She left the bedroom and refused to ever set foot in it ever again. When the DYST team arrived, she sat in the living room to wait while the team set up their equipment. Then, she observed as the small creatures gathered around her in a group of six. They were curious, sniffing her and testing their boundaries while not letting her get too close. She believed that they were trapped by the dark entity who used them for more mischievous activities, such as tormenting Bill in his bedroom, the noises, and subtle happenings. While pondering this, she heard a commotion from the bedroom where the team was setting up. She saw a large black shape leap from that direction and onto the chandelier, causing it nearly to swing and collide with the ceiling. It jumped down into a corner to hide away from the investigation team before lunging onto the chandelier again and bouncing it to the opposite hallway. The large figure took up the entire hallway entrance before it disappeared, and unsure of how to process what she had just witnessed, she simply collapsed into her chair. The DYST team convinced her husband Chuck to sit in the closet in Bill's room, and he had utter confidence that nothing would happen. The lights were turned off, and Chuck just sat and waited. After several minutes, he became impatient and spoke loudly at whatever they told him was supposed to be there, attempting to provoke whatever it was. For a few minutes, nothing changed, but eventually, Chuck felt the atmosphere change and become heavy and oppressive. He heard bangs and things click together around him. His every instinct told him to get out of there as fast as he possibly could. The team saw Chuck emerge with wide eyes and a face as wide as a ghost. All he could say was that there was something in that closet, and neither he nor Melissa stayed long after this happened. Brian Hall, after thorough investigation, enlisted the help of any experts that he could find to try and help Bill. Reiki masters, Buddhists, Wiccans, occultists, anyone and everyone who would attempt to drive out entities was contacted. But sadly, none of them worked. Bill became used to the look of defeat upon the people's faces who earnestly tried to help him, but accomplished nothing. Eventually, Brian reached the end of his ideas, and he sent a single email to Bill. It was straightforward and to the point. It said, You, sir, need a priest. Throughout the trials that Bill was forced to face, he found himself struggling with borderline PTSD. He was constantly in a state of hypervigilance, looking over his shoulder and watching his peripheral vision for even the slightest sign of something supernatural. He was dealing with an opponent he couldn't see, but one which could see him and even attack him at a moment's notice. The suspense kept him from sleeping, and he met each evening with dread. He could no longer distinguish his nightmares from reality. He would have a habit of laying down and then closing his eyes for a few seconds, then opening them again to search for anything that had gone amiss. The fatigue would take its toll. He often took naps in the daytime to offset the sheer exhaustion that he was experiencing, but it was all getting to him. The months turned to years, and the activity inflicted a cost upon Bill's health. He had two bouts of pneumonia, two heart attacks requiring stents, and the emergence of cluster headaches, 
which Bill had never experienced prior. He only wanted the constant torment to stop, yet he did his turmoil quite well and became good at pretending that things were better than they really were. Putting up a front of normalcy despite the reality of his situation, it also affected those who visited Bill's home to the point that few stopped by, effectively isolating him. At night, he would hear loud crashes inches away from his head. He'd awaken to find scratches all over his body, and always in threes. He'd get touched while laying in bed, would be hit and shoved, and even felt the sensation of being electrocuted. He would look around his room one night, just wondering just what this entity was that was plaguing him. Suddenly, his covers were torn off his body. He sat up in bed and saw a black shape at his footboard looming over him. It stood about six feet tall with the body of a man, and the man was wearing a large trench coat and a fedora hat, all as dark as the abyss. When he noticed it, it moved towards him, or rather, it floated. He felt an experience that went beyond mere fear or dread. He described it as the sensation of pure evil. It traveled the length of the bed, got within two feet of his face, and then vanished. During the investigations, they had taped a dark mass in the very location that this entity had just disappeared at. It darted rapidly across the room, rose above the bedroom window, and then simply dissipated. Bill was so disturbed by this new threat that he could not and did not speak about it to any of his friends or family at the time. However, Bill was not the only person that this entity that he referred to as the Hat Man would reveal itself to. A friend of Bill's named Devin claimed to see the entity. It had revealed itself to him, but he believed it to be friendly, and as a result of this, he wasn't scared of it. After apologizing for not warning him and showing Devin other examples of the Hatman entity appearing to others on the internet, he cautioned him that if he sees it again, to not communicate with it. It is not a friend, and unfortunately, Devin did not take his advice. The Hatman would continue to appear to Devin, and at one point, Devin described it as appearing in Bill's closet with glowing red eyes, uttering, in a deep growling voice that felt like it was scratching the interior of his skull, and it kept saying, Kill Bill. After this, Devin began to change. He transitioned from frightened to angry, and finally to violent frenzy. Bill would often come home to find his house torn apart, and he would later learn that the hat man had appeared more times to Devin and had motivated him to do this. It wasn't until Devin threatened Bill with a large kitchen knife in his hand that he began to see just how serious the situation had become. One evening, after Devin had a tantrum of throwing and breaking things within Bill's house, he told Bill that he's here and he's come to kill you. Bill, saying to himself that this creature can't kill me, was trying to keep calm. Devin responded with, Turn out the lights, and you'll see, with a malevolent and evil grin on his face. Bill was unsure whether he had lost his fear, or no longer cared, or simply wanted to shake Devin out of the throes of this strangeness. Regardless, he shut off the lights. Although nothing happened, and Bill proved that the hat man had no authority over him, Devin's personality only grew more aggressive. Eventually, neither Bill nor the police, who were often seen at his home, could resolve the issue, and their friendship came to a sudden and terrible conclusion. Bill believed that the hat man was the general, the main source of evil power to which all the other activity orbited around. He began to learn from his experiences accepting that he was in a war with an unseen foe 
that was using tactics and strategy as well. That it utilized scare tactics and fear to wear him down in a war of attrition. But the more Bill learned, the more that he was becoming an adversary against their assault. Bill returned from a meeting and decided to lay down for a nap. He saw indentions like hands and feet in his mattress, so much that it became impossible to sleep. Then he heard a massive crash as if something had hit the side of his house. He shot up and went inspecting looking for damage, but ultimately found nothing. Feeling a pure white rage well up within him, he screamed, I've had enough, and you don't scare me anymore. I'm not the same person that you picked on years ago. Show yourself and fight me. One of us is going to hell tonight. He then heard another crash and ran towards it, continuing to yell at the entity to show itself. Hell was unleashed inside of his home like a hurricane. Crashes and booms filled the air. Suddenly, the missing puzzle piece clicked into place. He knew that no amount of anger or desperation or earthly knowledge would save him from this evil, so he called upon Christ to intercede. He screamed, You're not invited, and under the authority of Christ, I demand you leave or be bound by your worst fears until final judgment. He kept repeating these words, as new crashing sounds emanated around him. Eventually, 30 minutes of unrestrained malice ceased, and a new peace finally filled his home. In the days afterwards, he felt a new sensation amidst the peace, like that of a chained up rabid dog in the distance, just watching and waiting for a chance to break those chains and come back into his life. While occasional things would happen afterwards, Bill no longer felt the evil that dwelled within his home or his life. However, the encounter left scars, both physically and mentally. He still struggled with looking over his shoulder and being comfortable sleeping at night. His health effects from the ordeal also never truly improved. Whether it was from the evil presence or simply the stress of the events, one can't be sure. In the years since, Bill has studied and become an expert in demonology in order to help others fight against an unseen foe in their own lives. He founded an association called United Paranormal International. Bill's story has been featured on the show Paranormal Witness in 2013, and abridged versions of the events have been featured across the internet. Bill has given multiple interviews on various podcasts but decided to set the record straight in 2022 with his book, Satanic Warfare, Tactics of the Demonic. In it, he gives his own account, as well as the eyewitnesses in his life, of the events that transpired. He also includes extensive entries over just what he had learned concerning the demonic forces that stalked him and others, but he cautions anyone attempting to utilize his methods. He says that spiritual warfare is a form of psychological warfare, that it utilizes fear tactics to wear target down, so that over time, you spiritually break down and obey the evil one's power. It is based on negative emotions such as fear, stress, anger, and social disunity, and as a victim grows weaker, the demon begins to grow stronger. The first line of defense is to have no fear against demons. He states that as fallen angels, demons still have rules that they must follow. They only enter lives to the degree which we explicitly or implicitly allow. They are not all-powerful, for if they were, they would be not forced to resort to scare tactics and trickery to wear down their opponent. However, they have the experience of the entirety of human history on their side when they wage war on us. Once you acknowledge that there is in fact a demonic presence, the only recourse that you have is to call upon the name of Christ. Bill has since retired and moved out of the house in which he suffered for many years. He now lives with his wife, Caroline Vale, and his son Richard in Arkansas, 
In Bill's story, we can see how curiosity was used as a doorway. A doorway that can lead to knowledge and understanding. However, curiosity can be used as another kind of doorway. One that, once it's opened, can unleash a terrible darkness into our lives that isn't easily cast out. Don't let that be you. Thank you guys so much for watching this new video and uh, sorry about my messy hair. I'm very much overdue for a haircut and I'm super aware of it. Uh, don't forget to like this video if you guys liked it. Uh, share it and leave a comment. Also subscribe with notifications on uh, if you haven't already. All that stuff helps me out tremendously in this crazy ever-changing landscape that is YouTube. Uh, I will see you very soon with another new video, and I will also soon, probably on that next video, be drawing for the winner of the signed Mystery Archives poster from the Amons Family video. So if you haven't entered, I would go ahead and go enter. All you have to do is like the video, share it, obviously be subscribed, and leave me a comment, and we're going to do a random drawing for that. So until next time, this has been Cody here at Mystery Archives, and remember to stay safe out there especially from demons and, and other spooky things. And uh, take care. Hidden deep within the walls of an old home, something ethereal is lurking and watching. For years, the family who calls this place home thinks the entity is harmless. But they would soon discover after an accidental provocation, that this was not the case. Evil will rise, and its tendrils will infect everything they touch. Will they make it out alive, and with their souls intact? This is the chilling, untold story of the demon of Brownsville Road. Our story begins with the Kramer family. Bob, who was an officer in the army, and his wife Lisa, married in 1980. They would soon start their family, and upon leaving the service in 1986, Bob would take up a job with AT&T, and the family would find themselves living in the New Jersey area. Having always wanted to relocate back to Pennsylvania, where they grew up, an unexpected opportunity for a transfer presented itself, and the Kramers seized it. Although having just built a house in 1987, the couple now found themselves shopping for homes in Brentwood, Pennsylvania. While looking at potential buys, Bob comes across a home that he never thought he'd be able to live in for sale. An old historic home from his childhood this wasn't just any home, however. It was the home that Bob himself grew up seeing almost every day. He had always felt a pull to the home, to what it represented to him. The history, its style, and way of living, as well as it being a symbol of success. Bob would make contact with the sellers and arrange a walkthrough for him and his family. As the Cranmers arrived, and began to tour the inside of the house. Their son, Bobby Jr., wandered off by himself as the group went into the basement. When they returned, they found the poor young man crying and hyperventilating as if he had seen a ghost. Thinking that perhaps due to the boy's young age and imagination that he had just scared himself in such a big house, Bob and Lisa wrote the behavior off. As they concluded the tour, despite his wife's misgivings about the size and feel of the house, that it gave her the creeps, Bob dismissed her, seeming almost mesmerized by the home. He continued to question the realtor, and would ask the question almost no one asks in these types of situations. Is there anything wrong with the house? Understanding exactly what he was hinting at, the realtor said that nothing was wrong with the house and that Catholic mass had been conducted several times in the living room. The realtor would then simply move on with the conversation.
Bob found this response to be odd, but nonetheless took the reassurance that had been implied. Later, according to Bob, the couple seemed very anxious to move out, almost as if their very lives depended on it. Thinking initially that they would want to haggle, he submitted a lowball offer to them, and to his shock and amazement, they accepted it without any further negotiations. Not only excited to live in the childhood home of his dreams, but to get it at such a good price almost seemed too good to be true to Bob. And perhaps it was. The year was 1988, and it's a cold December day, but this day is filled with warm feelings. The Cranmer family has just closed on the purchase of their new home, a designated historical landmark by Pittsburgh History and Landmarks. And in due time, they would travel from New Jersey. Bob, Lisa, and their four kids, Jessica, who was four years old at this time, Bobby Jr., who was three, David, who was two, and Charles, who was just two months old, would move into and begin living in the home on Brownsville Road. All seemed normal at first, but this calm normalcy would not last. The family began to notice small but bizarre things happening in their home. Doors began to open on their own. Objects began to move and go missing. Faucets would turn on by themselves. And, many of times, even if the family had been out during the evening, when they would leave the home with the lights being off, they would return to not only the lights being on, but after a quick sweep of the house, every door and window being secured would have no rational explanation for it. Every single light, including those in the basement, would be on, and this was enough to make the family think. Although it was weird, they weren't really scared at the time. Lisa and Bob did come to the conclusion that they had a ghost, thinking it could have been due to the age and potential history of the home they were in, but they simply considered it to be Casper the friendly ghost. Not a threat, and nothing to worry about, or so they thought. Things weren't always incredibly active though. Soon things calmed down somewhat in the months that followed. The family started to settle into their normal everyday lives. The occasional strange happening here and there quickly became commonplace, but every so often, things would pick back up. Alongside the previously mentioned activity, they soon began to hear mysterious banging noises all throughout their house and at all hours of the day and night, as well as disembodied footsteps echoing all around. And although weird, the family ultimately grew to accept these happenings, again, as normal. Over the years, Bob would go into politics and would hold political office in the 1990s, first as a councilman and then a county commissioner, gaining local notoriety and status in the western Pennsylvania area. But despite his career achievements, his family was slowly falling apart. Year by year, it seemed as though things became increasingly dysfunctional for the Cranmer family. Bob and Lisa would fight frequently and all of which would contribute to Lisa and two of the children experiencing serious mental health issues that would require hospitalization. During the ensuing chaos that was becoming his family, Bob had the fleeting thought that whatever was in the house, perhaps, had contributed to the mental distress of his family. But whenever this feeling would come up, he would simply dismiss it. One night, in 2003, his oldest son, Bob Jr., would attack Bob in his sleep. A vicious and unprovoked attack, as if his son was in the throes of madness. At this time, it was Bob, Lisa, and all of the kids except for Jessica living at the house, along with Bob's elderly aunt. Bob Jr. would be restrained and arrested. 
following the aftermath of this night, the next morning, Bob's aunt would be found deceased of natural causes in her bed. Thankfully for Bob Jr., all charges would be dropped associated with the attack. But these series of unfolding events seemed to break the dam that had been holding back the paranormal within the Cranmer home. As if the levees had been breached, a tidal wave of spiritual energy would now be unleashed. The following year in 2004, despite her chaotic and scary childhood, Jessica, the oldest, moves back home with her husband Tom and her son Colin. There was an apartment up on the top floor of the house that Bob felt like would be a good fit for the young family. He offered to let them live there so they could save money, get everything they needed to in order, and eventually buy a house of their own, something that was becoming increasingly more difficult to do. He also felt that this was a good healing opportunity for the family, allowing them all to be united and together once again. As his daughter and family moved their things in, Bob would take off his coat and go to hang it in the large walk-in closet underneath the main staircase. But as he opens the closet door, he notices that the pull chain for the light is wrapped all the way around the fixture. Thinking it was just the usual weirdness, and being rather used to the unusual by this point, Bob dismisses it and unwraps the chain. Being raised Catholic and continuing to be a spiritual man into his adulthood, Bob for the first time decides to do something about the activity. On a side table near the closet, he had a Bible and a rosary. Believing that this would calm things down, he took the rosary beads and tied them to the chain of the light. Upon closing the door and starting to walk away, he hears the clinking of beads. Rushing back to the door, he opens it, only to find the rosary and the chain wrapped completely around the fixture yet again. Dismissing things at first, but now thoroughly alarmed, Bob grabs his Bible, steps into the closet, and begins to pray out loud. He continues to do so for half an hour. During his time in the closet, he can't help but notice that he feels a heavy weight upon his body and the sensation of eyes boring a hole into the back of his skull. After the half hour, he finishes and leaves the closet, closing the door behind him. In the weeks that follow, Jessica and her family begin to settle into their new home, the apartment on the third floor. As Tom goes to check on his stepson, he opens his door to find a woman standing over him. Believing it to be his wife, he calls out to her. The woman then turns and takes several steps towards him and then disappears before his eyes. Tom wastes no time in protecting the boy. He rushes and scoops Colin up and quickly rushes to him in Jessica's room. Jessica, at the time, tried to dismiss what Tom had seen. She thought that if she didn't acknowledge it as reality, then it couldn't be real. Tom rushes down the stairs and consults Bob immediately. Bob, not wanting to take any chances with his grandson, decides to sleep in the room for the night. After going up the stairs into Colin's room and closing the door behind him, he turns on a lamp and takes a seat in a nearby chair and begins to pray. After an hour or so of reading scripture, he decides to try and get some sleep. Laying on his grandson's bed, he slowly drifts off. Sound asleep, he is soon woke up by massive bangs coming from inside the walls near his head. Waking up in a panic at the sound, his eyes dart back and forth, searching for the source. He then feels a sharp, stinging sensation 
on the side of his neck. Jumping up, he runs over to the mirror in the room, and what he sees shocks him. From underneath the right side of his ear, down his neck, and onto his torso, there were three long and now bloody scratch marks, as if something had clawed him. Frightened and unsure of how to deal with this new situation and the emotions he felt himself experiencing, Bob, for the time being, decides to not discuss the matter with his family, not wanting to further concern them. The following day, Bobby Jr., the oldest son of the family, was in the living room studying for an exam. As he sat on the couch, taking notes from his textbook, he suddenly began to feel as if he was being watched. This made him uncomfortable, so he decided to step outside to get some fresh air. He made his way towards the front door, and as he got several feet away from the door, he heard something fly past his head with a sharp tone and crash into the wall beside him. Bewildered and glancing down at his feet, he finds a CD from a nearby stack near the entertainment center, shattered into a dozen fragments. There is no one else in the room. Unsure of what else to do, he quickly heads to the front door and leaves. Fearing for the safety of their family, the Cranemers, now at their wit's end with the reoccurring supernatural events taking place in their home, decide to contact a Catholic priest for help. A man named Father Mike Sylvania is who they speak with, and he agrees to assist them by coming to bless their house. In due time, he arrives. As the priest begins his blessings, in an effort to sanctify the home, he travels from level to level and room to room, starting from the main floor to the basement and then to the upstairs. But it's when he heads upstairs that he begins to realize just what this family has been dealing with. As he walks up each step, he too begins to feel the stare of a thousand eyes upon him and the hair on the back of his neck stands on end. He knows then that they're dealing with an infestation, whether it's human spirits or non-human, he can't discern at the time. He finishes his blessings and encourages the family to persevere, and then he leaves. Weeks later, when the rest of the family is out, Jessica finds herself alone and asleep in the upstairs apartment. As she lays in her bed, with the large moon hanging overhead, its light piercing the windows, she is suddenly ripped out of a dream state. Her eyes open, but she is unable to move. It's as if she is paralyzed, but completely coherent. Along with being frozen, she suddenly feels as if someone or something is sitting on her chest. Then she sees it. A large, shadowy figure is at the foot of her bed. As it starts to climb on top of her, she tries with every fiber of her being to scream, but all that comes out is silence. To her anyways. Her mother, who had just returned from running errands, heard her screams from the moment she entered the house. Running upstairs, she finds her grown daughter almost inconsolable. She's shaking and crying. Whatever it was that is tormenting her had disappeared. However, regardless of age, the love of a mother eventually brings her back to reality. The family is now beyond worried, petrified, is almost an understatement. Their every waking moments are filled with anxiety and dread. They had hoped that word wouldn't get out, but unbeknownst to them, their situation had caught the attention of the Bishop 
of the Catholic Church of Pittsburgh, who in response assigns an experienced priest by the name of Ron Lingwin to their case. Upon reaching out to Bob on behalf of the church, Father Lingwin concluded that based on what Bob had told him and the sound of his voice, the overall feel of the call, that this case needed to be investigated further, that this family needed help. He gave the Cranmer family two options. One, they could stay and fight and have the backing of the church. Or two, they could leave, but it wouldn't be guaranteed that whatever these entities were wouldn't continue to haunt them. So as a family, they decide to stay and fight. As preparations are made by the church to send help, the family tries to hold on. One morning, shortly after the phone call, as the family convenes in the dining room for breakfast, Bobby Jr. comes down and sits at the table. As he explains to his mom that he didn't sleep much that night, that he tossed and turned, he started to feel a burning sensation on his back. Before Lisa's very eyes, she watched as scratches formed on her son's back, like an invisible hand had taken a razor and sliced him. Each one was approximately six inches long. Calling for Bob, he takes one look at his son's back and immediately begins to panic. He then starts checking all of the children's backs, and all of the boys have the same three markings. Remembering back to when he was scratched, he asked the children calmly to go and wash their cuts while he spoke to Lisa. He then finally comes clean about his own attack. He discovers that it's not just him and the children who have been physically marked. His wife, who had been nursing her own wound, comes clean as well. Located on her left shoulder was a bite mark, one that was so deep that it drew blood. It in fact had continued to bleed underneath her shirt. Upon further analysis, the bite wasn't like that of a human. It was as if whatever the creature was had fangs of some sort. They were puncture wounds. Refusing to wait, Bob immediately calls the priest back. Later that day, after receiving special permission, Father Mike returns to perform mass inside the Brownsville home. Believing the scratches to be one of several indications that the infestation within the home was demonic rather than human spirits. Following Mass, as Bob and Lisa are sitting at the dinner table, eating together, they receive a call from upstairs. Jessica, not wanting to intrude on their time together, asks if Colin can come down. He wanted to see his grandpa and grandma. Saying that it was no problem, Jessica sends him headed downstairs. From the top floor to the second level is three sets of stairs, and as the young man descends headed towards his grandparents, they suddenly hear him shriek. Bob gets to him first and finds Colin shaking like a leaf. The poor child is screaming monster and pointing at an open door. It was at this moment that Bob knew that whatever this thing was, wasn't going to stop. That in order to keep part of his family safe, he would have to move them out of the house. The feeling is bittersweet. The family has grown to love the house, but at the same time, Jessica is relieved to get her son out of the situation. Bob, Lisa, and their three sons, however, remain. Several days after Jessica and her family depart the house, Bob returns home from work. Walking through the hallway headed towards the kitchen, he gets that sense that he's being watched. He stops dead in his tracks and slowly turns around to face whatever could be there. However, he sees no figure. Instead, he sees streams of what appears to be blood on the walls. 
fresh blood leaking down as if to mimic how the priest had blessed the home using holy water. Wanting to make sure he wasn't crazy, Bob calls out to Bobby Jr. to come and see what he was seeing. The two share a moment of shock and unease. The walls were indeed bleeding, and it was unlike anything that they had ever seen before. Bob, at the wit's end of his wit's end, again calls the church. He speaks with Father Linguin, who tells him that he's about ready to make the recommendation to the bishop to sanction a proper exorcism of the house, but that the family had to endure one more test. He told him that they needed to have an outside, third-party, non-religious group come in and document their findings, and then turn those findings into the church. So Bob makes several calls and arranges for such a group to come out. A paranormal investigation crew that originated out of Penn State. They would arrive in January of 2005. As the two other members set things up, the main leader, a man named Adam Bly, finished up a tour of the home with Bob. Unbeknownst to Bob, his main job was to perform an informal psych evaluation on the family to determine that they were of sound mind and not just spinning fantasies. He would determine that they were indeed sane. Upon further inquiry, he asked Bob when things started to get bad, if there was a catalyzing moment or area of the home. Bob, thinking back, immediately thought about the closet. Upon explaining what had taken place and how things had escalated since that day, Adam believed that this demon was originating from underneath the stairs, in or near the closet. Knocking on the wood exterior of the stairs, it sounded hollow. Believing that the origin could potentially be found there, Bob agreed and assisted him with opening it up to look inside. It was no easy task, but the best way was to cut the wall from the inside of the closet. So they did. Among the cobwebs and dust was indeed an open space, a hidden room of sorts, and in the center of this room, covered in even more dust, as if it had been sealed in was a strange-looking altar, and to the right side of this altar was an incredibly old piece of paper. Upon further examination, the paper contained drawings, the name of the original owner, as well as the name of the word Malik. Malik would turn out to be the last name of the original owner of the home. It's also just one letter off from Moloch a demon from the Old Testament most commonly associated with the Canaanites who worshipped this deity and sacrificed children to it. After making this discovery, Adam wanted to take a moment, so he wandered off back into the main living room space to breathe. He then suddenly, out of nowhere, began to see the letters S-A-T-H-I appear before him. And then, something invisible scratched his forehead. Adam's screams quickly garnered the attention of the rest of the crew, who quickly rushed to his aid. They try to console him, but he's more driven to figure out what the word may mean. Running to the home base setup for the investigation, he quickly begins searching the internet. And what he finds bewilders him further. Sati is the name of a female demon that is said to serve under Moloch. Her primary function was to encourage women to sacrifice their children to him. Based off of this new information, Bob begins searching the history of the home for anything that could be out of sorts, and one such piece of history soon catches his eye. Where the property now stood was once the site of a grisly native and settler war. 
which took place in the 1790s. One such story was that a woman and her two children had been killed by the tribesmen near Fort Pitt, and her house was roughly six miles from the fort, placing it almost directly where their home would be now. All of this death and sorrow, Bob wasn't surprised that a demon now called the land its home. In further efforts to uncover the cause, Bob also hired professionals who scanned the property with ground-penetrating radar in an effort to ensure that no bodies were buried there. However, as the crew scanned the earth, they would find the remains of four bodies in what appeared to be a burial plot in the front yard near the old oak tree that stood there. Not wanting to further disturb the dead, Bob opts to commemorate them instead by placing crosses into the ground to hopefully lay their souls to rest. Although the death and despair more than likely attracted a demon, it still didn't answer the question as to why it came inside the house. One theory was that a disgruntled worker back when the home was being built placed a curse on it, which would account for the hidden shrine underneath the stairs. However, this couldn't be confirmed. Several months after the investigation and turning in the information to the church, Bob and Lisa finally received some much-needed good news. The church has finally approved an exorcism on their home. In September of 2005, an exorcist arrives to begin his work. All appeared to be quiet, and truthfully, things went on without a hitch. The following day, the feel of the home was different, but Bob still felt as if something was lurking within its walls. Roughly three months would pass without incident. One night, Bob was in the basement doing some work to the hot water heater when he suddenly was imbued with that age-old feeling of being watched yet again. Something that he had hoped was a thing of the past. Glancing up, he spots the figure of a woman who then quickly darts into another basement room. Rushing into the room the woman had gone into, he sees nothing. Rushing up the stairs, he runs into Lisa and quickly tells her that he saw something down there, that they needed another mass as soon as possible. So together, they once again call Father Mike, who agrees to assist them. The following evening, as the priest is mid-mass, all three of them begin to hear scratching coming from inside the walls. During the consecration of the wine, three distinct knocks are heard, coming from inside the wall nearest the priest, something that should be an impossibility. The mass would conclude, but the war had not yet been won. It would ultimately take another two years of frequent blessings to finally rid the house of the demon that inhabited it. With this somewhat anticlimactic ending, because of course, not every story is going to be over the top. There are still many details I'd like to share with you, as well as pose several questions. The reason they believe that a disgruntled worker may have placed a curse on the home during its construction was that the worker was jealous of the wealth of the man who built it, a doctor and his beautiful wife. However, apparently this doctor had a dark secret. He was locally known for performing illegal abortions within the house, ultimately tying back into the demon Moloch and his consort, Sati. The book in which Bob Cranmer wrote, is known as The Demon of Brownsville Road, wasn't received without criticism. However, the most valid would be that some of the historical matters referenced, as well as the bodies in the front yard, hadn't been confirmed by outside sources. The doctor, however, was confirmed to be real, and his name was Dr. James Merton Mahan. 
However, there is no record of any illegal activity, such as abortions tied back to his name, taking place at that time, or his house. The Cranmers, following their experiences in the home, haven't been without tragedy. In March of 2015, their son David passed away unexpectedly, sending both Bob and his wife into a deep depression. They would divorce in 2018, ending their 37-year marriage to one another. After a decade of the house being fully cleansed of evil, Bob has now opened it as a bed and breakfast since 2019. It is now known as the Brownsville Roadhouse. I truly wish all those involved the very best. The entire situation seemed not only traumatic to have to endure, but the more recent tragedy as well is just terrible. With that being said, the story is a well-documented and textbook demonic haunting, and a terrifying one at that. Sometimes, when you walk into a new environment and you get a terrible feeling, no matter how good the deal is, you have to trust your gut because it might just save you years of anguish and spiritual despair. Considered to be one of the most terrifying films of all time, the movie The Exorcist paralyzed the masses upon its release and brought the devil home to millions of people. Although the horror and special effects enhanced the story being portrayed, what if I told you that the story itself was inspired by a true story of demonic possession. When a young boy loses his beloved aunt, he starts to dabble with the occult and makes contact with the other side. But what he contacts isn't what he bargained for. What follows not only terrified a family, but by proxy thousands of people all over the world. This is the terrifying story of the exorcism of Roland Doe and the demons that plagued him. Our story starts in 1949 in a small town known as Cottage City in Maryland. A boy who we'll call Roland Doe is mourning the death of his beloved aunt. Aunt Millie's passing was very sudden and the two had been extremely close. Millie was known for being an avid spiritualist, perhaps a new age person of her time and was always very interested in things like spirits, the afterlife, and Ouija boards. Seeing this activity, the young Roland became very interested as well, and alongside his Aunt Millie, he was taught by her how to properly use a Ouija board to contact the other side. Following her sudden death over the summer of 1948, as Roland mourned her, Tucked away in a trunk of her belongings, he rediscovers the Ouija board that Aunt Millie had given him. In a moment of desperation, he laid the board on a nearby table and attempted to speak with Aunt Millie once again. But alas, despite his best efforts, no movement came from the board. It is this moment that is believed to be the catalyst for what would follow. Just days after Roland had used the board, things started happening, but not with the board itself. The entire family started hearing a steady dripping sound with seemingly no origin. And after this continued for about a week, they called in a plumber who ultimately would find no evidence of any sort of a pipe leak. Then the drips turned into thumps and scratches both of which were seemingly coming from inside of the walls. The family, trying to make sense of the activity, first suspected mice. So as they had with the potential leak situation, they scheduled and then had a well-known exterminator come out. He too would find no evidence of any sort of infestation. Over the next several months, things would continue to escalate. 
Furniture began to move by itself, and other items were hurled across the room by an invisible force. The portrait of Jesus that hung on the wall began to rattle and shake as if it was being hit from behind. The happenings continued to grow with intensity, leading to a crescendo. The force seemed to move out of the walls and into Roland's room and then into his bed. One night, he was violently awakened to his bed shaking profusely. He screamed for his mother who came in and experienced the terror as well, leaving both of them at a loss for words. The family tried to decipher what was happening. They soon had Roland examined by a doctor and then a psychiatrist, both of whom concluded that the young man was very stressed out, but otherwise healthy. Day after day, the poor boy was being plagued by forces that he couldn't see or defend himself against. Markings began to materialize on his body. The first markings spelled out the word, Bowdern. Beyond frightened and trying to find a resolution, the family used the Ouija board to try and contact Aunt Millie. They would indeed contact something. When the board began to interact with them on its own, and the atmosphere of the room changed, they asked the spirit to prove that it was real. It obliged by hurling a chair across the living room. And this wasn't the only sign. The following morning, long, burning welts appeared on Roland's legs, just as the previous markings had. This time, it spelled out the words, St. Louis. The family now had to consider the unthinkable, that their son was perhaps in the grip of something demonic. They quickly contacted their local pastor, who was a Lutheran, who came to the house to pray with the family. But after he too witnessed the marks appear on the young man's body, he suggested that the family contact the Catholic Church, since they tend to deal with these kinds of things. The family went ahead and fled the area in hopes that the activity would stay at the house. But after relocating with a family member in the suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, the paranormal happenings continued. Terrified and not knowing what else to do, the family reached out to Father Bowdern at the local Catholic parish, who, after a lengthy discussion, wasn't convinced that the boy was possessed. Bowdern, who was a World War II combat veteran, was a hardened man, but very practical and religious, no doubt. Not convinced, but wanting to help ease the family's stress, he agrees to pray over the boy. In due time, he would arrive at the house, and he would also be joined by a fellow priest by the name of Raymond Bishop. After meeting Roland, they all decided to pray together, and to the priest's great surprise, as soon as the first several sentences of prayer were uttered, the boy began to scream that his chest was burning. Upon opening the boy's shirt, they could see red cuts in his skin begin to appear. Now scared, the priest began to pray over the boy more intensely, lasting from about 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. At the conclusion of this session, Roland finally fell into a restful sleep, or so it seemed. After explaining to the family their thoughts on what could be taking place, they decided that they would convene among themselves to try and decide how to move forward to better assist Roland and his family. The priests returned to their homes and then met the following morning. It was here that both men decided that they were dealing with the real deal. Together, they made the decision to pursue an exorcism. Father Bowden, a senior priest, reached out to the Archbishop of St. Louis to ask permission to perform the rites of exorcism, which he was granted under one request. That request being that he provided a day-to-day -day account for the church, to which he agreed. 
each segment of this story from here on out is written with excerpts of what the priest documented during his experiences. Father Bowdern and Father Bishop returned to the residence one week later. They went upstairs and entered the boy's frigid room and began the ritual. Roland began to violently act out, so with the help of the boy's father subduing him, they were able to continue. It would be written out that the boy's blows were beyond that of his age. Each punch had the strength of one or more grown men behind it. Father Bishop found this out the hard way. Mid-prayer, Roland managed to break loose from his father and punched the priest in the face. It would later be discovered that he broke his nose. Following the aftermath of this first night, all for the first time in a long time, seemed calm. The boy did not act out, but rather was unconscious and just peacefully slept. Perhaps, they thought, the prayers were beginning to work. However, that was until the priests left. Almost as quickly as their feet crossed the threshold of the residence, the boy began to yell and scream at the top of his lungs. This belligerent rage would last for hours. At the desperation of the parents, once they were able to recontact them, both priests returned as quickly as they could, and with the assistance of both the boy's father and now mother, they had no other choice other than to continue the ritual. Hour after hour, for approximately four hours, Roland screamed, and contorted. Suddenly, the boy began to lurch as if he was going to throw up. He quickly asked for the window near his bed to be opened, which his mother did. Roland rushed to the window and vomited a thick, black-looking substance. Within minutes, he seemed to be normal, like his old self, for the first time in a long time. The family and the priest knelt down and thanked God. Kneeling beside him, they gave thanks for what seemed like a triumph of good over evil. But from the ritual Romanum, the Catholic rites of exorcism, sometimes the devil will leave the possessed person in peace to make it appear as if he has departed. The exorcist must see through this with the power of God and realize this is a trap. The boy seems to rest for the first time, and the family feels a true sense of relief. Or so they think. It's now 2 a.m., and an uneasy quiet fills the house. The priests have been gone for several hours, when suddenly, Roland's screams begin to fill the house once again. Deep, guttural screams, as if something otherworldly is trying to break through his physical vessel. There is no rest for the wicked, nor is there rest for the good. Priests are called back yet again by Roland's parents and arrive yet again around 3.15 a.m., shortly into the bewitching hour. They return back to Roland's bedside, where he begins taunting and screaming at them an all-too-familiar happening now. After several more hours of intense prayer, out of nowhere, the young man goes catatonic around 6 a.m., frozen like a statue. For all intents and purposes, he appears to be sleeping, but with his eyes wide open. The priests, not wanting to leave the home in case the devil decides to reappear yet again, take to visiting with the family for several more hours and conserving what little energy they have left. And it's a good thing that they did because bizarre activity resumes around 8.30 a.m. with a vengeance. Various knocking noises accompanied by Roland's screams resume a seemingly never-ending hell. There is now more violence than ever before. Roland is exerting strength beyond his normal capacity. He begins barking in multiple octaves 
as if there are two voices inside of him, fighting to escape. Amidst the chaos, his mother breaks down and has to leave the room for her own sanity. The boy she's looking at, she no longer recognizes as her son. Within due time, thankfully, Roland yet again goes catatonic. Following this event, Father Bowden suggests that the boy be sent away to a worthy place where the exorcism can continue. An unfamiliar and sanctified place that will assist them in calling upon God to intervene in what is quickly being seen as the most intense case of possession that either of them had ever seen. This way, Roland is away from his mother and can no longer cause her any further distress as well. Ultimately, it's decided that he'll be sent to a hospital ran by an order of Catholic monks, not too far from his current home, as well as the church in which the priests operate out of. A bit of a crossroads of sorts. After strange happenings and his terrifying behavior, his first night there, Roland is placed in a private room on a private floor above the psychiatric ward, not only for his own protection, but to keep him from scaring the other patients within the hospital walls. Father Bowden returns the following evening with Father Bishop, and now with the additional help of Father Halloran. Halloran, who was a young seminarian then, was tasked with the main job of restraining the boy, if need be, during the prayers. And during times where things were calm, it was his job to visit with him and keep his spirits up. As the priests made their way to the top floor and entered Roland's room, Father Halloran began visiting with Roland and his father. Bowden then blessed them with a small vial of holy water and then placed the vial on the dresser next to the bed. Just a few seconds after this, the vial flew across the room and smashed into the wall, shattering it into multiple pieces. In a later interview, as the only surviving priest who witnessed the activity, Father Halloran stated that that's how I knew we were dealing with the real deal when that vial flew by itself across the room and smashed into the wall opposite of the dresser it was placed on. You read about these kinds of things, but they never really happen. Realizing that they needed to begin to do battle with the darkness that resided within the young man known as Roland Doe, the ritual formally began yet again. The boy began screaming and cursing the priests. He also revealed one of the telltale signs of possession as things began to escalate. Father Halloran's mother had recently passed away, something that Roland had no way of being able to know, especially since the two had only met for the first time before the prayers began this very day. He looked over at the priest and with a dark and sinister smile across his face said that his mother said hello, that she was rotting within the depths of hell. This both angered and scared the young priest, but also served as a distinguishing factor for him personally that there indeed was another entity inhabiting the body of the boy that sat within this very room with them. Something dark and malevolent. As many of you may or may not know, exorcism typically speaking isn't a one and done kind of situation. It can take months or even years to fully rid someone of one or several demonic entities, if at all. In this case, is no different. The prayers continued until Roland went catatonic and was laid peacefully back into his bed. Wanting to take an aggressive stance to rid the boy as fast as they could, all three priests, along with Roland's father, would again return the following day. Roland by this time was so violent that all four men were having a hard time holding him down. Aside from the multiple voices and curses, he began spitting a foul-smelling liquid at them as well. As the day continued, 
The boy was screaming that Father Halloran was hurting him as he was restraining him. The young priest loosened his grip and was instantly punched in the face, breaking his nose, leaving him a bloody mess. This concluded the ritual for that day. The ordeal for all those involved was quickly becoming an excruciating nightmare that they couldn't wake up from. Every day, all day, there was very little sign of progress. As for the priests, the task is exhausting, soul draining, and at times, faith breaking. But despite the discouraging signs, like any battle that has to reach an inevitable conclusion, the ritual must go on. With each exorcism, Roland becomes more violent, more angry, and also begins spontaneously urinating on top of his other abhorrent behaviors. As more objects begin to move more regularly, as the paranormal manifestations continue. On day 18 of Roland being in the hospital, he asks for a pen and paper from the priests, and upon receiving it, he writes, I am the devil himself, and within ten days, I will give you a sign. Shortly after writing this down, it begins to scream as the Roman numeral ten carves itself into the skin on his chest. Witnessing this, Father Bowden decides to baptize the boy to hopefully aid his crusade against the demons that plague him. The following day, with Roland's permission, he performs a baptism, which seems to calm him down. But this calm was all too short-lived. After just about ten minutes, he returns to his fits of anger and curses. Night after night, the prayers continue. And night after night, the boy is still overwhelmed. Roland screams, and the word in capital letters is seen carved into his chest. Exit. Horrified, the priests continue on with their prayers. The devil now seems to be speaking through Roland's body. As he says, you need to say one more word, but you never say it. After the night's end at the hospital, the priests were puzzled as they pondered what this strange statement could have meant. But as they read through the Book of Exorcism, they realized that Father Bowdern was forgetting to read the word Lord time and time again. This not only frightened the men further, but also affirmed their suspicions as well. The following night, it was an ice-cold, rainy night as the priests arrived at the facility. They could immediately sense that something wasn't right. From the parking lot, they could see that the lights on the floor that Roland was placed were flickering on and off and in different rooms. As they checked in at the front desk, the clerk broke down in tears, trying to explain that things were especially bad and that she was very scared. As they approached the boy's room, they noted a strong sulfuric smell coming from inside and unlike previous nights as soon as they entered the room Roland began cursing at them but this time in fluent Latin a language he had never been exposed to prior to the exorcism's beginning let alone one that he should have been fluent in he also had never displayed foreign tongues before as the priests began the ritual again Roland stated that this was their sign. Father Bowdern then commanded the spirit to prove itself. And as the words left the priest's lips, the boy smiled and touched the priest's purple vestments that were draped over his shoulders. They then burst into hundreds of individual fibers. Now with their worst fears realized, the priests began to pray harder than they had ever prayed before. During the struggle, Roland broke a bed spring and attempted to stab Father Bowdern, but thankfully was restrained before he could do so. He thrashed, 
urinated, threatened, and screamed in dual octaves. Five hours into the prayers this night, he began to exhibit a new and frightening behavior. Before everyone's eyes, Roland tilted his head back and slowly began to float up and towards the ceiling. Before he could reach the ceiling, the men forced themselves to power through their fear and grab the boy, bring him back down to the bed where new restraints were then placed, tethering him from further floating. After seven grueling hours of fighting, praying, and nerve-wracking spiritual warfare, the boy gasped and exclaimed. He said he saw St. Michael the Archangel use a flaming sword to drive the devil away, that he hit him and drove him back into the darkest abyss one could ever imagine. With these words, he fell silent and finally closed his eyes. Truly and peacefully asleep. After this long and arduous night, what began over 28 days ago seemed to have finally been worth it. Roland slowly but surely returned to normal and in fact went on to live a rather ordinary life. The records of the events from those 28 days were somehow leaked to the press and became an embarrassment for both the priests involved and the church. Father Bowdern had always regretted Roland's confidentiality being violated. William Peter Blatty, who had heard about the case, became extremely intrigued and reached out to the priest to discuss it with him. When asked about if he knew the whole thing was real or not, Bowdern replied, I had no doubt about it then, and I have no doubt about it now, that what was in that room that night was the otherworldly source we call the devil in the flesh. William Peter Blatty took his inspiration from this case and wrote the book, The Exorcist. So was the possession case of Roland Doe a genuine one? It has in fact been considered to be one of the most substantial cases, if not the most substantial case, by the Catholic Church in the last 300 years in regards to the existence of satanic forces and the existence of demonic possession. By others, however, it was just an emotionally compromised adolescent who was acting out after the death of a close loved one. But what do you think? Make sure to let me know down in the comments below. And if this case indeed was the real deal, those implications have far-reaching convictions in and of themselves. That the existence of true evil also implies the existence of true good. And I would say regardless, with the on-screen inspiration and then adaptation of The Exorcist, these deep-reaching questions were then brought forth to thousands, if not millions of people all over the world, perhaps leading to a wider impact than anticipated. I think a deeper moral of this story is that the occult is not only very real, and I can say that speaking from personal experience, but that it is not for the non-experienced or the spiritually weak. You can never be truly sure of what you're communicating with. And for the majority of people, I would say this. Just don't dabble. It will greatly benefit you if you don't. Because you might just speak with something that may turn out to be your worst nightmare come to life.